Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to open the first webinar on the topic of plant-based food tech and agri-tech between Israel and Japan. My name is Hadas. I'm living in Kyoto since 2012, a PhD candidate at Osaka University Graduate School of Law and Politics, the co-founder of the Association for the Advancement of Academic and Cultural Relations Israel-Japan, a business develop consultant and IG, IJ Win member. From Planter to Plate is initiative of IJ Win Israel Japan Women Innovation Network. We are a group of women related to Israel and Japan that gather to support women to establish and promote their social and business activities. For more info, you are welcome to look, have a look in our new website. Check the chat box for the link. We initiate this webinar because we want to have a positive impact both on the private and public sector. Plant-based food tech and urban agriculture are the future of societies, and Israel and Japan are a great match for fruitful collaborations. Today and tomorrow, we will hear about the ecosystem of both countries, business and social activities by leading CEOs and advocators. In addition, we will present startups pitches. Although it is a long session, we hope you can participate in both days. I would like to thank all speakers for the support and to you attendees for taking your precious time to join us today. Minasama, honjisu wa o atsumari itadakimashite arigato gozaimasu. Kore yori IJ Win Shusai Shokubutsu Yurai Food Teku and Agri Teku webinar Planta to Plate o kaisai tashimasu. Vegan to vegetarian, no gyo no ugoki o kasaku ka suru tameni, nihon to israelu kara atsumata chomei shin, chomei ni tachi no panelisto, panel discussion o zehi o tanoshimi kodasai. Programu wa hotondo ga ego de okonare masu ga Ato ishukan e niwa honyaku no jimaku o tsuketa YouTube o upload shimasu no de ochira mo zehi koran kudasai. Sore dewa minasan yoroshiku onegai itashimasu. First, I would like to invite Mr. Kurita-san, the commercial attache of the Embassy of Japan in Israel. Kurita-san. So thank you for introducing me. I'm Moto Kurita, commercial attaché of the Embassy of Japan in Israel. First of all, I wanted to say thank you uh, to IJW members for organizing such an interesting webinar and giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, I will make some short remarks on behalf of the embassy. Firstly, uh, the business relationship between Japan and Israel is growing recently. For example, the number of Japanese companies having their offices in Israel is uh, 92 as of 2019. We will soon publish the number of uh, 2020, but it will almost the same as uh, 2019. Anyway, uh, it is more than three times as many as one in 2013. It is before when Prime Minister Netanyahu visited Japan in 2014 and uh, Prime Minister Abe visited Israel uh, in 2015. Regarding the investment from Japanese companies to Israeli companies in 2020, uh, uh, we, estimate, we estimated the amount of the investment uh, from Japanese companies to Israeli companies in 2020 uh, the amount is uh, about uh, $570 million. Uh, unfortunately, it is decreased about 25% uh, compared to 2019, but the number of deals is the second most in history. So we think the interest of Japanese companies, Japanese industries to Israel ecosystem is, has not shrunk. I wanted to attract your attention to a new trend of the collaboration between Japan and Japanese companies and Israeli companies. Traditionally, 
Japanese companies invested in Israel, Israeli startups, most in the field of IT, IoT, cybersecurity, and recently digital health and uh, automotive and fintech. The collaboration in the field of agri-tech and food tech was not so much. Uh, it is probably because of the difference of the climate and the food preference between the two countries. But last year, especially uh, on the second half of the year, some Japanese companies uh, announced their investment in Israel, Israeli agri-tech companies. For example, on July, uh, an electronic giant Hitachi led the investment round of Israeli agri-tech startup Taranis uh, with the participation of Mitsubishi UFJ Capital. Uh, Taranis was also formally invested uh, by a leading trading and investment company, Sumitomo Corp. And on December last year, uh, Kubota, uh, Kubota is one of the largest uh, agriculture machine manufacturer in Japan. Uh, Kubota invested in Israeli agri-tech startup C3. Furthermore, uh, this year in 2021, Kubota also invested another Israeli agri-tech company, Tebel. And uh, also this year, uh, Aleph Farms, Israeli cultivated meat company, announced a partnership with Mitsubishi Corporation. Mitsubishi Corporation uh, will distribute Aleph's cultivated meat to Japan, to Japanese market. I'm very happy to see this collaboration uh, happen. I think the both sides was uh, both sides has now uh, acknowledged the opportunities between Japan and Israel in this field. Yeah. In Japan, because of the aging society and the declining birth rate and so on, uh, the number of farmers has been decreasing. In 2020, it is almost one third of 20 years ago. And 70, uh, uh, around 70% of farmers in Japan are elderly people, meaning over 65 years old. Thus, uh, the government of Japan is now promoting digital transformation in agricultural field, utilizing AI, IoT, and drones. So uh, we consider uh, agri-tech and food tech as a key to innovation and uh, economic growth. And the government of Japan in, and Israel promotes export of agricultural products to each other's sites. On October last year, the export of Israeli avocado to Japan was approved. And this January, export of all food from Fukushima prefecture and the surrounding areas to Israel uh, was also approved. So we think the situation around the relationship of agriculture between the two countries has uh, improved so much. I hope uh, this event contributes a lot to the faster development and progress of the relationship uh, and the partnership between Japan and Israel in the field of agri-tech and food tech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the greetings, updates and insight, Kurita-san. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Noga Sela Shalev, the Vice President and Business Development at First Start Foodtech Incubator, IL, to talk about. Hi, hello, good morning and afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'll just share my uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, I hope you can all see this. So I'm going to try and take my uh, 15 minutes to try and cover shortly what's going on in the plant-based uh, protein world, uh, and then a short peek into the Israeli ecosystem. So um, protein uh, or plant-based protein is literally the king of uh, ingredients coming out of plant-based today. Um, I think like any other industry disruption, this is a combination between technological advancements, allowing better products to come to the market, uh, consumer changing their demand and uh, changing their awareness and of course funds that are coming in and driving this cycle further on. Um, and I'm going to touch a little bit about uh, each of these uh, elements. So 
Uh, starting with why, I guess it's pretty much common knowledge by now that uh, plant-based uh, products are far more sustainable than animal-based agriculture as we know it today. And there's a kind of a very good snapshot that was prepared by the Good Food Institute kind of showing the differences between um, meat products or traditional meat products and plant-based meat uh, in terms of land use and water use, in terms of the reduction of uh, um, pollution, both of greenhouse gas emission and water pollution. And also in terms of public health, the fact that there is a increasing um, uh, resistance to antibiotics happening because of the increased use of antibiotics with the animal uh, uh, traditional agriculture, which the lack of use of that in plant base is a huge advantage. So I think the why is pretty much common knowledge by now. And we see a lot of investments going into this field. Um, actually, in the US alone, over half or almost 60% of the investments done in this field were done in the last past two years. And this is a good indication of how the market is evolving dramatically, driving that cycle that I just described. Um, and these investments are going both into later scale uh, or later stages uh, in, a, in startups uh, that are more mature in later rounds and also into very early stage projects that are driving the technology and kind of changing the field both in upstream and downstream. So this is uh, good news for this, uh, the plant-based uh, world. Um, and peeking into the market, I think the main uh, description of what's going on is mainstreaming. Um, and this is driven both by change in consumer awareness, uh, the environmental concerns that I just uh, referred to, of course, are pretty obvious, but also health awareness, of course, to the benefits of a plant-based diet. Uh, maybe concerns about uh, allergens that are coming from animal-based products. Um, and these are both very uh, prominent in the last few years uh, in the US and in Europe, and are also dramatically increasing in Asia Pacific, which is considered to be one of the key drivers of the market growth. Now, the numbers that you see here are kind of one of, of many estimates, but as you can see, we're talking about a very big market of uh, um, plant-based alternatives. Uh, with dramatic increase in, in consumption. Actually, the passing year has been a record year of increase in this uh, market's uh, consumption uh, in the US and Israel, 10 times fold uh, of any other category growing. Um, and this is also coupled, of course, with changes in the market itself. I guess uh, the best way of describing it is, is just that we in many ways are reaching better parity with the products that are uh, plant-based to their uh, counterparts that are a traditional animal-based protein um, in terms of taste, uh, in terms of pricing that is much more available right now and more accessible, and in terms of availability in stores. And this is coupled with uh, um, changing marketing strategies. You see more and more plant-based products um, uh, present and, and presented to the consumers side by side with their counterpart, the uh, animal-based protein uh, products, um, which is uh, creating more availability, which is creating more uh, um, uh, interest, which is creating more demand. And of course, we also see the big market players uh, supporting this trend dramatically. So you see the large producers, the well-known producers in this field expanding. They're investing in their infrastructure, they're investing in distribution and production, they're um, uh, extending their per, uh, penetration to the market and to other consumer bases. They're diversifying their portfolio and they're partnering with the existing players in the food market. So there's really, really no big producer today that does not have some sort of plant-based products uh, in their portfolio, either by uh, mer mergers and acquisitions or by uh, self-development and cooperations. There is no uh, big uh, food chain or no big... Uh, um, food service uh, brand that doesn't have some sort of plant-based solutions. And you can see some of the examples for this on the right end of the slide, but this is really just a very, very short example. Um, recent uh, uh, news of, of the call between uh, Beyond Meat and, and McDonald's are just another example to this. Um, so this is actually happening. This shift is happening. This is happening in front of our eyes. Um, and I think if we want to kind of cover the innovation that happens in this field, we have to go back to the source. Um, again, the Good Food Institute just lately holding a very interesting webinar on plant-based protein, which I highly recommend everybody to kind of take a peek into, had a very interesting coding system of kind of covering the different types of, of uh, plant-based sources that we can see today. And this is very a, a partial list. There are literally dozens of new sources that could be reviewed. And this kind of covers what we're looking for 
when we're talking about plant-based protein in terms of the concentration of protein, its quality, um, is it, does it have any type of allergen risk uh, in it? Uh, the commercial stage of it, are we still in the research and development phase or are we moving ahead into treating this product or this source as a commodity? Um, we're addressing flavor, which is a key matter of actually allowing us to apply this type of source to different products and, and better mimicking the, the uh, counterpart or counter uh, animal-based product. We're looking at functionality. Is it a texturizing agent? Does it have to contribute to the nutritional values? Does it allow us to create foaming or any other uh, functional um, application that we wanna mimic when we're trying to create new products in this field? And last but not least, and very much important, is the, the matter of cost and, and scale. How, actual, how accessible is the source? How widely uh, grown is it? And of course, how uh, expensive is it in terms of price per kilo? And the very uh, tight margins that we see in the, see in the um, industry. So this is kind of very, uh, a very good way for us to kind of scale and look at the different sources. And what we see today in most plant-based products is a wide use of soy and wheat. These are kind of the leading uh, ingredients used. A lot of it has to do with texturizing, which is a key issue. And I'm gonna to touch a little bit about it in, in a few slides ahead. Um, and the agenda is today to kind of find the right combination between the different sources in order to create a good balance between our need of cost and nutrition and, and, um, and the right application, uh, the availability of it, the cost of it, and so on and so forth. So a lot of innovation is going on here in trying to find the right source and, and benefit the, the, in the best way out of it. Um, so this kind of brings me to the next step uh, or the next uh, type of development or technological advantages that we're trying to reach in the market. And a lot of this is in many ways kind of overlapping, uh, but I'll try to cover it real briefly. So in terms of nutritional values, a lot of the products that we see today are not that best in, in terms of nutritional value and we really would like to improve that. And we're looking for something that will have a protein that is as good as animal protein, which is um, highly digestible and highly uh, bioavailable. Um, we wanna reduce the use of products that uh, bring anti-nutrients into the, into the product itself uh, and just generally have a better uh, quality of, of nutritional values in these products. Um, a lot of the compromises that we see on this end come from the need to have better functionality and have an application of, of protein into final products that will uh, be uh, stable and will create a, an overall experience that is as similar as possible to the counter animal-based protein pro product that we're looking for. Um, so in terms of that, um, we're looking for better dispersibility of the, of the protein in the ingredient. We're looking for um, solubility, we're looking for foaming, we're looking for the ability to maintain formation. If we're talking, for example, for, to, on the, uh, about the products that are kind of trying to mimic uh, the, the, the meat or the meat products that we're used to. Um, so functionality is still key and is not yet solved. And there's a lot going on in attempts to, to allow, uh, for example, uh, as I said, form maintaining, not losing oil, not losing water, when we heat the product to actually get a better foaming uh, experience if we want to have kind of a better dairy alternative and have the functionalities of an egg when we're using that, uh, a plant-based uh, alternative for it. And this also has to do a lot with our, our wish to have an overall uh, better organoleptic experience. We eat with our eyes, we eat with our nose, uh, we want to have the right texture and the right bite. And this has a lot to do with uh, functionality as I just uh, described and kind of a better sense that what we're eating is, that is actually as good as the original that we're aware of. And this is a key matter in order to create a really, an even bigger revolution or even bigger uh, acceptance of this type of product. Um, I think this is also uh, completed by our wish to have a cleaner labels or minimally processed products in this field. So all these kind of uh, um, areas are all areas that we're uh, working on right now technologically in order to kind of close the gaps. Um, just for example, a lot of the, of, of the ingredients that we see today, first of all, there's a very long list of ingredients and we want to reduce that. We see a lot of processing going on. Um, in many ways, we need to have better binders and the need to mimic the original uh, counter animal product, uh, animal-based product 
uh, create the use of materials that not necessarily we want to use going ahead. For example, um, synthet synthetic aroma flavors that are kind of easily disappear, for example, or, or not well uh, maintained when you heat the product and so on. So these all four kind of mix together. And we can't complete the discussion without touching upon scale. Uh, again, the need to have better prices uh, to create better availability, the need to, to uh, find crops that are, for example, year round, um, that have better uh, percentage of protein in them in order to have better extraction processes that are more uh, um, efficient, for example. So if we kind of combine all of these together, I think we are more and more focused on novel ingredients and on novel production technologies and on novel sources and crop optimization uh, to summarize the areas in which plant-based is, is focused on today um, in a nutshell. Um, if we look at the map of the protein global landscape, uh, Olivia Fox kind of publishes every once in a while a good overview of what's happening in this field. So you can see in the middle here, um, the world of plant-based products or plant-based, sorry, uh, uh, startups and, and companies that are operating divided into meat, eggs, and dairy. You see a lot of fungi-based products coming in. This was something that was not that um, popular uh, just a few years ago and is uh, expanding dramatically. Uh, on the right hand ingredients that a lot of them are plant-based. So this is a very much expanding world. And I think if you wanna have kind of a quick peek of uh, what we're gonna look at, how the map is gonna look at uh, just in a very short while, and this is happening in front of our eyes, our eyes sorry. Um, we can dive into, for example, dairy-based um, plant-based products, which have been around for a much longer time and is a fully developed market. So you can see the different sources that are used today. You can see very big players that are operating all across the categories. You see a lot of categories that are uh, uh, sold today and are developed today. So this is kind of a really maturing market. And this is kind of a quick peek of how it's gonna look in a very short while, in my opinion. Um, I'm gonna take the few minutes that I have left to uh, quickly overview what's going on in Israel. So in short, this is a, I think, very helpful snapshot prepared by the Startup Nation Central uh, team to kind of overview of, of, to have a good overview of the food tech agri sector, agri food tech, sorry, sector in Israel. And, the key takeaways, I think, uh, from this uh, good map is, first of all, the number of uh, startups in this field, um, a lot of them in early stages, a lot of them with uh, very new technologies coming in. Uh, another item here is the public sector support. There's a lot going on here. Um, the Israeli Innovation Authority and the Ministry of Agriculture are highly supportive of innovation in this field, as, for example, our incubator. Um, we see a lot of investors operating in the field. We see a lot of multinational presence in Israel, either by creating R&D centers or by other models of, of research or, or investments or scouting. And last but not least, and very much important to this uh, um, area is of course the academia, uh, which is very, um, I'd say, uh, oriented into applicable innovation. And this kind of brings me to, um, highlights of why this is actually happening in Israel. So uh, again, tech transfer units are actually uh, first ever in the world were created in Israel. Academia looking to, to commercialize the innovation that's happening there. Um, and I think, uh, I guess everybody knows the six degrees of separation. You know, I have six people in between every person in the world and another person. So in Israel, it's two. So this creates a very close and very supportive ecosystem, very short circuits in order to promote innovation. Um, combine that with the, um, some sort of cultural culture of entrepreneurship that has to do with uh, the limited resources that Israel had, um, driving also the developments in agrotech and biotech, putting Israel as a world leader in this field. By the way, if you combine agrotech and biotech, you get food tech together. So this is also a good explanation of why this is happening and some sort of openness to new flavors uh, and new things coming into the market. So we combine this cultural uh, um, say perspective and, and kind of construct, uh, structure perspective and you get a good uh, explanation of why this is happening and add to that the high rates of vegans and vegetarians in Israel and you get a good idea of why um, alternative protein as a whole uh, has been a good driver of innovation in Israel. 
Um, this is really a very quick snapshot of uh, some of the food tech companies that are operating in this field. By no means, this does not cover all that is happening, uh, but it gives a good idea of both the types of, of uh, startups that we're seeing in Israel. Uh, a lot of the investments that are happening in the past few years or two years or so uh, with the, a lot of money pouring in uh, and companies that are operating all the way from crop optimization through ingredients and all the way to products eventually. Um, just to finish, um, this is for a start, a uh, short introduction to just before I'm uh, closing here. So we are a uh, Israeli Innovation Authority incubator, part of the incubator plan, uh, focused of course on food tech and we're powered by four equal partners. We have two industrial partners, uh, Tuva, which is Israel's uh, largest food company and Temple, which is a leading beverage company. Uh, and then we have two financial partners, Our Crowd, which is a crowdfunding platform, and Tomister Ventures, which is an agri-food uh, VC, global VC. And this gives us a very good industrial perspective, um, access to full funding cycle, uh, of course, a global network. And we are also part of something great that is happening in the north of Israel, um, the creation of an agri-food cluster supported by the uh, Israeli Ministry of Economy. Uh, both in funds and in concept and creating the right infrastructures for creating new food tech startups in this area. Um, so that's that. I hope you'll have a wonderful webinar and uh, thank you for having me again. Thank you, Noga, for the detailed review of the plant-based food and agri-tech ecosystem. And it looks like a much brighter future after hearing your presentation. Thank you very much for your support. I would like to invite Jonathan back. Jonathan is a partner at Global uh, IoT Technology Venture, a Japanese uh, boutique VC that invests in early stage deep tech startups and focuses on digital transformation, industrial IoT, industry 4.0, uh, IA, automotive, and logistics. Hi, Das. Um, and hi everyone, thank you the IJ Win organization for inviting me. Um, I will say a few words and then uh, maybe I could share a few slides to describe about uh, a bit about GITB and what we do. So again, my, my name is Jonathan Beck. I'm based in Tel Aviv, um, but um, uh, GITV is a boutique venture capital firm uh, that invests in early stage deep startups outside of Japan. So not only in Israel, uh, but also in the US and other places in the world. Our mission is to find the unique technologies in innovation clusters outside of Japan. Um, and uh, this is why I'm based in Tel Aviv. So we see Israel as a, as a major hub of, of innovation, obviously. Um, in addition to our investment activity, uh, we work closely with our LP investors, which I will elaborate and mention a bit uh, uh, later on uh, about them. And we're trying to build with them open innovation within these corporations. Uh, so we're working to connect between the corporate investors that invest in GRTV to the innovative companies uh, that we have invested in and to build business uh, and technological collaboration. Um, so, in terms of our Israel activity, so far we have a total of eight portfolio companies, uh, which is almost half of our portfolio. Um, and uh, with our support and activity in the last two and a half years, our LP investors have conducted in aggregate a total of around uh, 40 uh, four zero POCs uh, with the local Israeli startups. Um, so this gives us the signal that uh, we're working in the right uh, direction to connect between the startups and our LPs. And moreover, uh, we have so far five projects that have undergone a commercialization process. And already there's business, not just the POC engagement, but the real business between uh, the startups and um, our um, LP investors. Um, I would like to show a few slides. Um, one moment. So 
So yeah. So yeah, uh, just just a few uh, few words about GITV, and then uh, uh, later I, I will touch on our angle uh, to the agri tech and food tech, um, which is obviously very relevant both to Israel and and to Japan. So yeah, so we are GITV. Um, yeah, um, early stage. Um, VC, we invest uh, seed stage, post seed, and A round in the main areas of the uh, industrial IoT, AI, robotics, manufacturing, 5G, cyber, the digital services, everything that around the digital uh, uh, transformation, the DX that is going through the uh, Japanese uh, industrial uh, companies. Um, so, um, just a few words about ourselves and the team. So the founding uh, uh, of, of GITV was by Mr. Adachi-san and Mr. Uh, Kinoshita-san. And later on, I joined them as a partner. Both are uh, strong veterans of the uh, Japanese high-tech industry. Um, Mr. Adachi-san is coming background from Itochu, where he was involved in the corporate venture. Um, and uh, Mr. Kinoshita-san uh, was heading, uh, uh, he was the CTO of Cisco Japan. And the two of them saw that the um, uh, fam of the Japanese corporation is doing business and doing the technological scouting outside of Japan, working with the startups out, outside of Japan is not working uh, in the right pace and in the right uh, uh, method as, as it should be. So there are many Japanese corporations that are active outside of Japan, mainly Silicon Valley. But if you measure the success, not about the investment, the success of the technological wins, the technological collaborations of actual Japanese corporates that integrate and is using now a, an innovative technology that came from a startup outside of Japan, the numbers are very low. So our idea was to try and build a new model that will combine the VC work of the venture capital early stage investment and the technological scouting, but to do it outside of the CVC, outside of the organization. And this is why GITV was formed and, and launched uh, about three years ago. Um, and we have offices in Tokyo. This is a photo of our office in in, in Israel, and uh, we we raised the money from the corporations alone, only from the Japanese corporations. So we don't have any financial investors like family office and uh, high net worth individuals and, and insurance companies and like that, who are only interested in the return. All our investors are Japanese corporations that are interested to do open innovation and to work with the startups. So. Um, this is kind of, you see here in this slide, our, our model. Um, and um, we are going through a very long process with each co corporate, with the city office to really understand the corporate needs, the corporate culture, the corporate current method for open innovation. And we try to see if there's alignment with what we do. And then the investment go to GITV and this is basically like R&D money for that corporation. And then we work closely with that corporation, first to do the scouting, then we do the investment. And this, this is important point. These two things can be um, in parallel. So we, we are doing the investment and then we work very closely with our portfolio companies, but irrespective of that investment activity, we also do specific scouting for each uh, corporation. And um, here is our uh, uh, examples of our, some of our LPs. And I will just mention two here. Uh, I'm sure that the, the Japanese audience are, are well familiar with all these names, but um, you can see here Denso and Toshiba are examples of uh, LP investors at GITV that has taken this uh, 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 
whole journey one, one step further. And after the investment in GITV, with our encouragement, they sent people to Israel. So today in the GITV office in Tel Aviv, I have one person from Denso and one person from Toshiba. They're not dealing with the investment, but they are doing the on-ground scouting uh, by themselves and we support them. And this is really accelerates the open innovation process within Denso and Toshiba. Each one of them is doing uh, dozens of POC on a yearly basis and we can start to see some commercialization uh, happening between them and the startups. Um, so this is another scheme of, of uh, uh, the, the, the way we, we operate, uh, but I want to get, uh, uh, I don't have much time, I want to get to the uh, agri-tech and food tech related stuff. And uh, this is why uh, this slide talks about examples of our uh, portfolio companies. And um, as you can see, there are AI companies, robotics, industrial IoT, and deep tech. This is just the portfolio from Israel. We also have companies in the US and in India, but um, the two uh, companies that are in red here, uh, DLR and SIBO, are um, food tech related technologies and they have clients from these industries and their use case is very much relevant for this theme. And um, uh, just a few words about DLR. It's an AI driven teachless robot control, basically a, a 3D computer vision technology that actually captures and, and learn very, very quickly what the uh, person is demonstrating, teaches the robot, the robot learns uh, 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 by, by instant how to do that uh, work. And then either if it's a, if it's a application of picking, sorting or packaging, uh, uh, it, it can replace the workers. Now, this technology is very much relevant for the food industry. Um, we are, have a few very good POCs and uh, use cases related to the food manufacturing and also in the agriculture in, in terms of picking and packaging the fruits. And this is very relevant to Japan. And ac actually this company is currently engaged with a, a, a big uh, agriculture and robotic company in Japan working on a project that is related to agriculture. Um, the second company is uh, Cibo. Uh, Cibo is doing the industrial IoT digital twin. It's a software for the process manufacturing and their main, main um, focus is on the uh, chemicals and the food manufacturers. So uh, they, uh, provide a great analytics and uh, predictive tools to improve uh, uh, the yield within the manufacturers. And just to mention uh, some of their uh, clients, it's Barilla or Nestle, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, manufacturers in the food industry, um, and, and also have a few engagements in Japan. Now, um, I see that uh, uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, I will jump to what's, what's next uh, for us. And this is, brings me again to the ag tech and food tech uh, theme. Um, we, we see ourselves um, uh, as uh, you know, the bridge between Japan and Israel. And uh, we see how the Japanese corporations are looking today on uh, the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, declared by the United Nations. And our next fund would be focused on these themes, doing investments in deep tech technologies, frontier tech, um, whether it's a, a material related or artificial intelligence or robotics or bioinformatics, but doing it in a, a companies that will improve the sustainability uh, goals that declared by the UN. And this is very much related to the agriculture and the food industry, which are a big part of this SDG theme. Uh, we want the uh, uh, agriculture industry to be more sustainable, uh, less polluting, more productive, and to address needs like uh, 
the aging of the of the farmers and the general uh, labor crisis that the uh, agriculture market in Japan is facing. And we feel that uh, uh, the technology, and we hope the technology from Israel uh, can um, really assist and promote with this. Um, I am. Um, I'm really happy to have this uh, opportunity to talk here. Uh, I see that I ran out of time. So uh, I will just uh, finish with this. And uh, I would like to uh, invite everyone who wants to further discuss this uh, to approach me on email or LinkedIn or whatever. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We will uh, put everyone contact list uh, on our we website so you can uh, contact uh, the speakers directly. And we'll open a forum where you can ask questions and we can direct it uh, to the spe speakers directly. Um, it seems that uh, you are looking for if, um, collaborations with plant-based food tech and urban agri-tech. And I really hope that this webinar will help you to find a startup to invest in and strengthen the relation between Israel and Japan. Next, I would like to invite Sharon Almog, IJ Win member, to moderate the next discussion panel. The big picture of plant-based legislation, business, society, collaborations, and coordinations. Sharon, the stage is yours. Thank you, Adas. Hi. Good morning and good afternoon to our Japanese audience. On this panel discussion, we will discuss about activism and the triangle of legislation, business and society, and the communication between the sites. I'm Sharon Almog, vegan, Israeli living in Japan, and an IJ Win member. Our panelists for today are Israeli Member of Parliament, Ms. Miki Chaimovich, Chair of the 23rd Knesset Interior and Environmental Protection Committee, former journalist, TV news anchor, and activist leader for the environment and animal rights. Previously, she launched Meatless Monday in Israel and oversaw its adoption in numerous corporations, organizations, and agencies. Because of the unfortunate ecological disaster that happened in Israel, Member of Parliament uh, Miki Chaimovich could not join us on this time due to an emergency meeting at the Parliament, but she will join us later on today after the last panel discussion, so we will do it then, so we will patch it together. Uh, Dr. Dikla Montecchio, Director of Investments and Partnerships the Kitchen Food Tech Hub. Dikla holds a PhD in plant physiology and genetics from the Weizmann Institute. She brings extensive experience in business development and international partnerships in ag and food tech. Omri, Mr. Omri Paz, founder and CEO of Vegan Friendly, a nonprofit organization that works to promote and enhance the vegan lifestyle in Israel and in the last year, also in the UK. The association was founded in 2012 by Omri Paz, chairman of the association, and has since launched numerous uh, groundbreaking projects. Thank you for joining this panel discussion. Thank Declan. you, Sean. Hi. Hi, Sean. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Dikla, tell us about the Kitchen Food Tech Hub activities. So we are a seed incubator and a, a investor. We promote impactful startups who aim to improve the food system and its supply chains and create safer, more nutritious and more sustainable foods. The kitchen vision is doing good, good by doing food. And we are um, uh, owned and supported by the Strauss Group, an international food group uh, mm. headquartered in Israel. Uh, we have a, a very good strategic um, partnerships with leading um, um, food giants like Mitsui, PepsiCo, Danone, Mondelez, Givaudan, and more. Thank you. 
Omri, please tell us about Vegan Friendly. What are your current goals and activities? Sure, thank you. Vegan Friendly is a nonprofit organization promoting veganism uh, originally in Israel, but now uh, also in the UK. Uh, we promote veganism in two different aspects. One, making it more accessible. So for example, labeling vegan products. We have over 7,000 uh, products labeled with a vegan friendly certificate. Uh, we encourage restaurants also to add vegan options. We have huge, massive events. Uh, just like two years ago, we had the Vegan Fest, where I think we had about 50,000 people joining the, the, uh, the, the festival. And the other aspect, we raise awareness to what happens in factory farming. So this small example, we had five months ago, uh, a TV ad that got to, I think, 15 million people in Israel and all over the world. And the, organization... the one with the sheep in the supermarket. Yep, yep. <laughs> that uh, was a good one. Extra fresh, yeah. We also had the biggest animal rights march in history, 2017, huge billboards. Uh, so yeah, the organization is really active, hundreds of uh, volunteers. And at the moment we have a staff of about 30 people in Israel and then uh, and growing, so yeah. Great, amazing job, really. I'm following your activity and I'm quite amazed. And we also have uh, Tutski the mascot. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Oh, my wine didn't join this meeting. <laughs> Dikla, what are the main difficulties for investors and entrepreneurs in plant-based startups? What, what's happening in the world in regards? Which countries have a good model in your opinion? So today in the market, there are the plant-based, but we also have the cellular-based uh, companies. Uh, which develop new uh, opportunities in this space. So it's not um, it's not coming from animals, but it's all not, it's also not a plant based. It's the real thing without the use of animals. Um, it supports the planet. It supports animal welfare, and it uh, gives consumer uh, the possibility to enjoy the real thing um, and not plant-based, not a mimic of. Um, so uh, I think that we need to speak about it also uh, because it's part of uh, the latest activities in this field. Um, the challenges uh, of investor in this field is to find the right opportunities in this crowded by the uh, involving market. So there are a lot of startups, uh, a lot of doing, and we also need to find the right uh, partners to uh, go with out along the way and give value uh, to the startups. Uh, so money is important, but not only uh, mm -hmm. money um, startups need in order to succeed. And the entrepreneurs uh, need to better understand the market that they are going and entering into. Uh, and they need to bring the right texture, the right flavor and taste, and also the right price in order to get uh, to each of us uh, without the need of a uh, compromise. So we are not compromised on anything. Uh, we are getting the right and the real thing uh, with all the added values, um, and we don't need to choose. This is our first choice. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Omri, three years ago, you lectured about how important it is to influence through politics in order to gain real progress. What has been changed since then? Is it better? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> a good question. Difficult one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, basically the organization was established in 2012. And for the first six years, I was really stubborn about not uh, being active through politics. I didn't believe in politics, didn't believe in the Israeli government. And, uh, but then in 2018, I was convinced that through a, a specific way of influence, it's uh, possible to make progress. Uh, in Israel, we have a, a political system where you have certain parties that have a, 
um, that have um, people that uh, enroll to the to the party, um, and they choose the the list of the parliament members. Mm -hmm. And we thought that if we can enroll a couple of thousand people to each one of the, the big parties, then we can have lots of influence inside the, the parties. Um, but what happened was that the political uh, um, reality changed a lot in the last three years. And a couple of things happened. First of all, we had four elections in the last two and a half years, meaning that you can't really do that much. Uh, and the second is that uh, big parties like Labour Party uh, went down from 25 uh, seats to almost, I, now they have about five, uh, but that's still not a lot. And the Likud party that we thought was a Democratic party, we realized that they disqualify uh, people that enroll to, the, to their party if they suspect that they're not, I don't know, 100% uh, uh, right wing, and mm. and a lot of times it's uh, it could be random. So even though in the long long run I do believe in uh, making a change through politics, at the moment I feel that it's extremely difficult because of what's happening now in Israel, and that's one thing. And the second thing is that uh, the in, uh, influencing from the inside of the parties, it's also a bit difficult because of what I just mentioned. Uh, theoretically, it is possible, you know, to you know invest a lot of time and resources, uh, having connections with the parliament members, maybe not even working directly with the parliament members, but more with the, the government offices. Uh, so that's that's possible, but it's uh, it's you know in the in the long run, lots of resources. You need to be really patient, and so in the moment we kind of. Uh, put our uh, initiative on hold to see, you know, what, what, what will happen with the uh, Israeli government. And so, yeah, so I'm not uh, that positive at the moment, mm -hmm. but definitely I believe in the long run that it's, uh, it could be very effective. And I think that maybe more effective than the uh, working through the government uh, is maybe working through the local uh, politics, uh, mm -hmm. the municipal politics. Mm -hmm. Maybe not for things like uh, food tech and stuff like that that need to be national, but for what we're doing in vegan friendly, you still have their budgets and you still have kind of like legislation. And so, yeah, so maybe that will be a direction that will, will or go Or more towards. educational. Uh, actually. Educational, definitely, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Dikla was talking about it with me, actually. Uh, Omri, what is the main difficulties from your perspective nowadays? That's a general question. <laughs> yes, it's like main difficulties uh, uh, <laughs> that you're facing in the UK, in Israel. Well, something interesting in the beginning, when we just launched in the UK, we had an issue of uh, kind of like BDS against us, but that was really in the beginning. Uh, mm. What was interesting though, the BDS came from actually vegan activists. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but since then that wasn't an issue at all, and the UK is flourishing. We have over a thousand uh, uh, businesses that have the vegan friendly certificate, and dozens of uh, different companies were labeling their products as vegan friendly. That's in the UK, and we just launched you know, uh, eight nine months ago. We have over thirty thousand followers there, so things are going really well in the UK. In Israel. I think in Israel, what's what's difficult for us at the moment is it's uh, still a relatively small country, not a lot of resources. If we would have done the same thing in the States or in another country, I think it would be one of the most known vegan organizations in, in the world. I don't think we our activity is, uh, is, is, is less than almost any other organization that I know. Uh, but everything that we do at the moment, they're in Hebrew. And in a small country, so mm -hmm. basically, just you know, to, to break through the Hebrew barrier and uh, and become international. And as soon as we do that, and we're already starting to do that in the UK, then things will start start to, to move really fast. Mm -hmm. Next, in the beginning of next year, we're supposed to launch vegan friendly in the United States. And just to keep the you wow. know trying to yeah just to understand the the growth of the organization. 
from 2012 to 2016, there was only one person in the organization. 2000 and until 2018, we're only four people. Now we have about 34 people in Israel and the UK. So yeah, so we're growing really fast, but still we have um, we have a, a, a challenge being in a small country that is, doesn't speak English. Yes, I, I know it from the books industry. I come from Hebrew literature and it's the same with the publishers. <laughs> Very small market. Dikla, uh, please tell us about your experience working with Japan. When we spoke, you brought up some wonderful ideas uh, for core collaborations uh, with the legislator and with activists such as Vegan Friendly. So please share your insights with us. So we are working with uh, Japanese companies in the last years, both our portfolio companies and the Kitchen Hub itself. So we have a close relationship with uh, Mitsui Japan, uh, Mitsui Australia and Mitsui Taiwan. Uh, they are very professional people and we are honored uh, to partner with. And uh, also our portfolio companies, have collaboration with uh, Mitsubishi, Somitomo, uh, Marubani, uh, Itochu, and more in order to promote food tech innovation in Asia. Um, as I see it, uh, working with Japan um, have challenges. Um, some of them are, um, um, are based on cultural gaps, um, but we also see uh, for our portfolio companies a struggle in a building the right infrastructure for go-to-market. Um, so this is uh, for Japan, but uh, in particular for your question regarding the connection between um, government and consumers, acceptness and investors. So yeah, there is a connection uh, between the three uh, because we can invest a lot of money in uh, the future of food tech but without the right uh, regulatory, uh, we won't be able to enter different markets and to operate and sell the product. And also without consumer acceptance and willing to try new things and uh, the willing of consumer to change um, and to um, influence the future of our children and the planet, it will be very hard to enter new things uh, to the market. So we need to work together, the investors, um, a ecosystem like OMRI uh, and uh, the regulatory um, uh, in order to make it right, make different future. Um, so yeah, it's all connected in the end. Yes, yes. How does it work with uh, those very big corporates like Mitsui? They are huge. I mean, are they very interested nowadays in plant-based foods investments? Yes, very much uh, in plant-based uh, and also in reduction of sugar. So the whole thing of well-being um, and uh, different diets it's very important for them. And as I said, it's not only in Asia, but also in Australia um, mm -hmm. and entering the market or different markets uh, worldwide. Um, and yeah, we need to work uh, together and um, meet a lot of times uh, during the year, uh, doing brainstorming and um, work closely uh, together with um, our portfolio companies um, in order to make it um, right. Thank you. Uh, what well, you we talked uh, when we talked on the phone. You mentioned the uh, uh, educational uh, activities. Do you want to give? Yeah, some I of your think ideas? education. Um, we can start there. I have three little girls, and I believe that um, if I will teach them um, that there are new possibilities to live and also they will uh, get the education from school and from kindergarten. Um, the whole consumer acceptance uh, will be different. And also when kids come from school and speak with their parents, 
So the parents also change their behavior. So everything starts uh, to uh, roll um, from early stage um, at our house, from the media, from the government, um, from doing stuff. Um, so as I said, we need to operate together in order to um, get the real change that we all wish to. Thank you. I would like to ask uh, both of you, uh, what is the ideal picture that you see in front of your eyes for, let's say, five years from now? How do you think uh, the collaboration can be maximized and lead to a wider angle planning and activity? Uh, Omri, the stage is yours. Well, I would love to say that in five years we'll be in a vegan world, but that probably won't happen. So for me, uh, ideally it's not you know, getting to the end goal, but, uh, but they're progressing every time little by little. So a higher percentage of vegans, higher percentage of the vegetarians, that will create a bigger demand, that will create a bigger incentive, um, economical incentive for the companies to create even more uh, plant-based products. If it's uh, plant-based products or if it's uh, um, uh, um, lab meat or uh, other products like that. And um, hopefully the big, um, in five years from now, we'll see a shift in the way governments see uh, this whole uh, industry. I think that in the moment, they're kind of aware of it, but they're not active enough. They don't put in enough resources in it. It's, I think it's like a decade behind um, the whole uh, uh, renewable energy that we do see governments uh, you know, passing legislation and uh, investing uh, resources in it. And it's not there yet with the, with the plant-based options. And so, yeah, so hopefully besides the things that happen naturally, like uh, you know, more people uh, that become vegan vegetarian and more products from the industry, hopefully in five years from now also, the governments will also step in and be more active and in that, yeah, this area. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dikla, what, what is your ideal picture for the so future? I'm thinking about flexitarians. So vegan uh, people and also vegetarian people have, um, have products um that they like um and are willing to compromise because a lot of times they don't like it uh, but flexitarians don't have uh, the right mm -hmm. uh, variety or enough variety in the market to make the change so my ideal uh, future a uh, short-term future is to see um more and more um um product in the market uh, that are suitable to people like me. I want to make the change, but I don't want to compromise on taste, on texture, on price. Um, and I don't have today the right products to buy um, to my house. Um, so I hope that we will see more and more a uh, new product in the market, not only plant-based, also plant-based, but not only. Um, they are more healthier, nutritious, uh, tasty, and affordable uh, for everyone. Okay. I want to have Thank the you. choice. <laughs> I, I just wanted to, if it's, if it's okay to add, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, still have time. Cool. That uh, what's interesting to say, I, I think the flexitarian market has started to, to jump in because if you look at the vegan, mm -hmm. uh, it, we have in Israel something that's called uh, uh, Stornext. It's a company that uh, is connected to all of the, the cash registered, registers in the country, mm -hmm. 80%. And they can show the different categories and the growth in the different categories. And the vegan mm -hmm. category has grown by between 10 and 25% every year since 2012, 2020. In Israel? Only? In Israel. Yeah, I'm talking about Israel. And the vegan, the number of vegans, the percentage of vegans and vegetarians has grown dramatically from 2012, 2014, 15. But since 2015, it hasn't grown dramatically, but the sales of, a, a, of, a veg, of the vegan mm. cheese and vegan meat has continued to grow dramatically. So we know that that <laughs> comes from flexitarians. So uh, even though I agree completely with the cloud that we need 
<laughs> better uh, products in the, in the supermarkets. I still, I, I still think that there, is, there has been a shift of flexitarians in the last three, four, five years. Yeah. But definitely we need better vegan products on the shelves, yeah. From Japan, I can tell you that I envy you guys. <laughs> I look at all those new products uh, and I'm like, oh, that will take years to get to Japan. No, they're coming. They're <laughs> on their way, I can tell you. I'm waiting for it. Yeah. Japan we has have, amazing uh, tofu, right? Yes, yes, yes. Beautiful tofu. And I get it to my house, like every Saturday afternoon, there is the tofu guy comes with a little truck and... Uh, and, don't the bell, and I go out and I ask for the for my tofu and yuba and it's amazing yeah <laughs> and it's super fresh and tasty uh, we have I, like I wonder, another yeah I wonder if he sees himself as a tofu guy yeah definitely a tofu guy and he won't cha change his profession <laughs> until the end <laughs> that's how it works here for the better and for the worse I think we have a, a question from the audience uh, and we still have like a minute or two so we can take this question uh, from Nisim Otomagzin. Uh, why do you think there is such a passion about uh, vegetarianism in Israel? 8% of the population is impressive. Well, I don't mind answering this, uh, if you want to add. Yeah. Go add ahead. To. Cool, so what's interesting about Israel is that until 2012, Israel was a very non-vegan country. We had less than 1%. It's just in the last uh, seven, eight years that we made the, the big leap. And so I don't think that there's something um, in the DNA of the country that makes it vegan. I think it's more, you know, uh, specific things that happen and lots of organizations that do a really good work and, and, and activists. So for example, the lecture of Gary Rovsky 2012 that, that uh, probably converted about 100,000 vegans. Uh, Dal Givo and the Big Brother, that was also something big and then lots of other big campaigns that we have. It's also a small country. So for us to get to 5% vegans and 5% vegetarians, it's, you know, that we need smaller numbers to, uh, to get to, those, to that percentage. Another thing is that uh, because we're a small country, things go here really viral. So, um, you know, we like videos on, the, on, the, on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube get almost all the country relatively easy. For example, the commercial got to about 4 million views in Israel. That means like 35, 40% of the population saw our commercial. And with a small budget, it was like $150,000. And um, yeah, so um, I don't, so I think it's, it's not something in the DNA. Obviously, we have a Mediterranean diet, which also helps, you know, having a mm -hmm. vegan lifestyle. And, and also we, we feel comfortable telling people what we think. So vegans and vegetarians feel really <laughs> comfortable telling people <laughs> not to eat animals. Uh, but yeah, but we also see a big growth of veganism and vegetarian in, the, in the Scandinavia, Canada, Australia, United States, uh, even Poland. So it's happening all, all over. And keep in mind that 95% of the people are pro-veganism, pro-vegetarian. They're against mm -hmm. animal abuse. The only thing is that they're used to eat, uh, you know, uh, animal protein. So yes. they're already there in their minds, but they just need to, you know, to follow That's through. Small shifting, yeah. yeah. True. Okay. Uh, Dikla, do you have anything to add to it? Uh, no, I agree with uh, Omri. Um, so, no. Thank you so much. Our time is up. Thank you very much for your smart insights and especially for your dedication to plant-based veganism. You definitely make a better world. Thank Together. you, guys. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you very much for this interesting discussion. I must share that um, less than 30 minutes uh, for my house. Uh, there is a traditional uh, tofu shop and they are very proud of their uh, vegan uh, products and they do write it in English and um, it's pretty known among um, 
localities and uh, tourists once the boards will be open again. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Next, I would like to uh, invite the co-founder and CEO of ACT Foodtech, Karmit Oron. Karmit is responsible for running all facts of the business focused on supporting the business growth of food tech startups. Karmit is the co-founder at WMN, an Israeli community for women tech entrepreneurs designed uh, to support women CEOs in their business challenges. Karmit will talk about women in agri-food tech changing funding practices. Karmit, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, we've established the Acting Food Tech Innovation Hub in 2020, and we're supporting the business growth of early stage uh, startups in food tech. Uh, usually the hardest part, and maybe the cloud was talking about that, is the go-to market, finding the best collaboration and, and supporting them with the business growth, finding uh, partners, finding distributors, co-packers, and others as, as we are taking them with this uh, challenge and helping them uh, penetrate the right markets. Um, so I'm gonna share with you uh, a woman in agri-food tech, uh, some insights, some understanding of what's happening and uh, how together we can put that as, as a focus and maybe contribute to the change. And I'm taking maybe the, what Dikla was saying about, she has three small daughters and she wants to support them while they're growing. So I think every, each one of us here today, this morning, has also to think about how can we all support uh, women-led ventures, not only in agri-food tech, but generally how can we increase the numbers. Uh, so if I'm looking into um, the agri-food sector uh, in general, is, is actually growing rapidly. 2020 was a record-breaking year in terms of VC investment in agri-food tech. And according to Finister Ventures, it was uh, nearly $12 billion capital that was raised in a quarter, the third quarter of 2020 alone. And we see that in the last 10 years, uh, there's $50 billion invested in agri-food tech and with over 3,060 VC rounds in agri-food tech. Again, in the last 10 years, with those uh, numbers of angel rounds of $1.3 million, early stage of three, around $3 million and later stage about $11 million. Okay, so we've seen the numbers, but something is still wrong. So women-led agri-food tech startups struggle to raise capital in later rounds. So if we're looking at this graph here, we've seen that there's two uh, sides of it. So it's the seed stage and series A stage. We can clearly see that male only here, if you can see my, uh, yeah, my marker are growing. Okay, so we have male only uh, startups. We have male female co-founder and we have female only, which is the light blue. And we've seen that it's growing, okay? And what happening in series A here, you can see that it's dropping. Although the numbers are from uh, 2018 and uh, we still see that the trend is still exists. So we see that it's very hard for women, for women in series A that are leading startups to keep on uh, raising funding. And still at the same time, we can see that uh, the blue here that I'm marking is rising up and the diverse team of male and women, women are also growing uh, here. So the, the graph is very, very clear and we can see, um, and we can see the, the problem. Okay, and if, if we're looking at this uh, uh, data coming up from Forbes, investigation, we can see that the fastest growing companies with 200% plus growth are 70% uh, more likely to have a female founder. Another data that is uh, interesting at uh, the women led startups uh, achieve 35% more ROI. So how can we actually describe the last slide that I was just showing you, which is still uh, stating that we have a problem. Let's look at Israel for a second. And, uh, and we, you've seen already the numbers and we've seen some uh, data that uh, Noga shared with you, but we've seen 
a growth in the agri-food tech development. Uh, as of the end of uh, 2020, there is 10 local hubs, as you saw, and accelerators, uh, 90, 91 invest, investors. And in 2019, there were 76 investors deals in this sector alone. So we see that in the number of transactions and in the size of the deals, we've seen uh, this growth coming up also in Israel. Let's see a bit about uh, the women contribution to the agri-food tech in Israel in 2020. So we have over 30 million collective raised in a series A by three women. We've seen Biomilk has raised $3.6 million in the end of 2020, Zero Egg with 5 million in November 2020, uh, Fitolon with $4 million. Uh, and we've seen something which is super interesting to see that um, we've seen two successful IPOs by women-led startups. What is Savor It uh, um, in, in November 2020 and Next Firm in uh, January, January this year. So what are we actually seeing here in this uh, chart? We've seen that uh, in 2020 alone, female entrepreneurs in Israel uh, are raising significant funding in various stages. So although we've seen a uh, struggle around the world, we've seen some use cases, if we're looking at this uh, chart of understanding that there is uh, success stories and we should continue and support those numbers and those uh, success stories. So the biggest challenges in, in, the, in the funding, uh, um, in the biggest challenges in funding practices are we have less female representation in large deals and dollar volume. We have large fluctuation in female funding, specifically in early stages. And we have challenges of securing sizable funding for female only founders. That's what we've seen in the chart I've just uh, showed you. So how can we all tackle the bias in agri-food tech funding? Okay, so what can we all do in order to put that uh, as something we can all uh, discuss and also support? So placing more women in decision-making roles to encourage female founders and CEOs. So definitely this one is an important one because we have seen that 82% of decision-making in VCs are male-dominated. So we do understand that if we have more women uh, placed in decision-making in also in, uh, in, in uh, VCs, in investment firms, we definitely wanna see those numbers maybe changing. Our, we need to highlight, we're highlighting female entrepreneurship and innovation via competition and events. I'm gonna show you and share with you in a moment this uh, competition we're doing in Israel in that sense. Uh, continue to educate investors on this structural bias and create accountability for diversity goals. And I think 2021 is a great year to discuss that, not only in agri-food, but we've seen this diversity uh, discussion coming up for many uh, countries. And there is a, a great support in many countries to wants to create those diversity teams. And, and we see, we've seen grants and investors are looking for diverse teams and female-led teams as well. So grants are giving more points, 40% more points in order to uh, encourage women to take this lead in startups. Um, we want to populate boards with, uh, with qualified female leaders and to put them in the, in the front and, uh, and, you know, and create this lean in uh, environment with women are taking, uh, are in the decision making uh, processes. And we want to create business support for women uh, led startups. And for my, uh, I'm working with the women uh, for the last five years. I'm, I'm, I'm doing that, of course, as a pro bono uh, with this organization that I'm representing as a co-founder, which is WMN. It's a community for female-led ventures, not only in agri-food. And the biggest challenge I'm seeing from, from them is mostly the business support. Uh, so uh, they either come from a very tech uh, or from uh, academia and this uh, leap that they need to do in the business growth is super hard for them. So they need much more support in networking and much more support in introduction to uh, potential collaboration. And this is something we've put as a major 
activity for us to support uh, them is creating this environment, which is very comfortable, very supportive and uh, open to create or to actually attract um, leads, business leads and deliver those leads into them so they can actually execute that. Uh, so this is an example for how we are supporting the ACT Hub together with our partners from the ecosystem. Uh, if you've seen those two partners before, you've seen Inoga from, uh, um, from Fresh Start and we have the kitchen with us, the club, you've uh, heard her before, and we have Copia and others, uh, very respectable partners from Israel that are working with us on this event that is going to be happening on June 6th. Uh, and the, um, the competition is actually going to work with all applicants to, to see, um, I mean, to, to look at their uh, uh, the innovation and technology. We'll pick six startups eventually that are going to be on stage on the 6th of June. But those six um, potential, I mean, those six uh, women-led ventures are going to get uh, three months of support in their, uh, in their business uh, goals, their investment deck, uh, their IP uh, structure, um, discussing in the way to collaborate with potential uh, global partners and many, many more. So it's actually very focused toward their needs. And eventually one of the women that are going to be on stage on the 6th of June is going to be winning also a term sheet of $200,000 from uh, Copia uh, Food and Ag, which is a, um, an active uh, VC from Israel. So this is our way to support the growth of uh, women in agri-food. And I think uh, this is still, although it's 2021, it's still something that we need to keep on doing actively to ensure that we have more representation. Uh, I'm not sure you know the numbers, but Israel, which is leading in the numbers, we have almost or actually less than 10% uh, women-led startups generally in Israel, not only in agri-food. So we definitely want to be uh, creating activities uh, and work uh, very strongly in changing those numbers. And I encourage you uh, to do so as well. And I'll happy to take any kind of a question if you have. Thank you very, very much for the insights and for your activities to promote women in tech. Um, I would like to uh, invite Sharon Almog for the next panel discussion, the evaluation of plant, the evolution of plant-based food in Israel and Japan. Sharon, the stage is yours. Thank you. And we are waiting for Shikma is here. Takashima-san is here as well. Hello. Hi. 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 On this panel discussion, we will talk about the changes that occurred in Israel and Japan in relation to veganism. Um, I'm Sharon Almog, vegan, Israeli living in Japan, and an IJ Win member. Our panelists for today are Ms. Shikmaya Kobi. <laughs> we'll soon see your video, your introduction video. I'm Jerikubi and I'm a food blogger and an influencer based in Tel Aviv in Israel. I'm currently running the blog Tivonit. I'm the owner of the blog Tivonit, which is one of the biggest food blogs in Israel today. I've been vegan for 12 years and I've traveled the world as a vegan up till today in 36 countries as a vegan. I lived in Japan for two years and in many other countries around the world. I'm a food photographer and a food stylist and currently working on my first cookbook. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. We can see it again and again, actually. <laughs> It'd be <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Mr. Ryo Ryora Takashima yeah. lives in Kyoto, Japan, owner of Peaceful Cuisine, internationally well-known vegan vlogger, a traveler, environmentalist, promotes vegan lifestyle, believes that a small change in human behavior can change the world. Hello, hi to you. Thank you for joining our panel discussion. Shikma-san and Takashima-san, <laughs> please tell us about the philosophy behind Tivonit and Peaceful Cuisine. What is your motto? Shikma, let's start with you. Ladies first. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the main goal of the blog is to make veganism accessible to anyone. Um, I think lots of people are very afraid to make the, the move between eating meat and dairy and eggs and being vegan or even cooking for someone else who became vegan. And yeah. uh, my blog is mainly um, trying to show people that it's not complicated at all and that they don't need to give anything up. There's a lot of uh, substances in my blog. I mean, there's like burgers and everything like, you know, cheese and cream cheese and everything that you had in the non-vegan world just um, in a vegan uh, version. I think it's really important and I think it helps people to make that transition. I love your recipes. They're so accurate <laughs> and so good. Great. Uh, how about you, uh, Takashima-san? The stage is yours. Uh -huh. Yeah, I became a vegan over 14 years ago and at that time, most of Japanese people don't know, didn't know about the, even the word vegan. So I just wanted to spread the word and you know, the, mm, giving the easiest vegan recipe that I could make on YouTube. And I yeah, really wanted to hope that helps their people to make more vegan food. Thank you. When I watch your videos, I'm, I'm amazed. It's so, uh, the atmosphere in your videos are so relaxing and like Zen type of videos. <laughs> yeah, I can watch it again and again. <laughs> it's like National Geographic of food. <laughs> Very good ones. Uh, Shikmasan, how do you see the changes in people's state of mind Uh, regarding plant-based foods, especially in Israel, that seems actually very advanced in veganism. Do you mm. see changes through the years? What are the yeah, changes? Yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, I came back to Israel after living abroad for 13 years, and I came back here like five and a half years ago. Um, and I can see an am amazing change in the last five years. I mean, it, becomes, it became mainstream completely. It's not just a trend. True. Um, I have like a few reasons that I think contributed to that, but it doesn't really matter. I'm re just really happy <laughs> that it became this way. I mean, there's low, the vegan scene here is massive and I think veganism is spoken quite a lot. So it's not like a foreigner idea. People are used to it and big companies are creating like vegan lines. And um, yeah, there's a massive change in Israel. Amazing. I think in every family in Israel, actually, there is a vegan person. I don't know if every family, but loads of them, definitely. <laughs> All the families that I know. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, Takashima-san, how do you see the changes in Japan? Uh, in the past few years, there are, I really started to see the word vegan everywhere in Japan. So it's Yeah, definitely growing. And you usually like in the big cities, in Kyoto, your city in Tokyo, or also uh, in smaller towns? I think it's everywhere in Japan. Okay, because when I travel, when we travel as a family, usually I need to get ready in advance in Japan, mm -hmm. like I need to make sure that I have a list of restaurants that I know that can, you know, give me like a nice vegan dish or that uh, I give like very detailed explanation about what I can eat, what I can't eat. Um, that's very encouraging what you're saying, Takashima-san, that you already see it uh, happening. Nice. Uh, lately, I've been in Kyoto and twice had a very nice lunch in a, a 100% vegan restaurants. Mm. And Sof and the, another one, which I can't remember the name, but was very, very good. And Sof uh, is by an Israeli uh, owner. Yeah. No, no, the, the, the owner is not Israeli. I, I checked it out. 
No, you know, Takashima-san, the, the word and soft in Hebrew, it's, uh, it's uh, infinity. Mm. So it's totally in Hebrew words, but I asked the guys in Tokyo and they said, no, he was in Israel. He's a Japanese guy. He was oh. traveling to Israel and then he decided that it's a very nice name and he felt like the, the connection with Israel. <laughs> That's why it's called Ensof. Shikma, tell us about your visits to Japan. <laughs> How was it <laughs> in relation to veganism? It was many years ago, right? Do you feel that plant-based Middle Eastern foods can be integrated in Japan as fusion with traditional Japanese cuisines that are plant-based? Um, I think, I mean, Japanese traditional food is mainly based on, not mainly, but there's a lot of vegetables. I mean, it's not like if you compare it to England for example when you have like Sunday roast just meat upon meat upon meat um, it's not completely like that and if you go to temples in Japan the monks are mainly eating vegan food so it's not like a completely you know foreign idea um, and in Israel there's a, there's quite a lot of traditional food that is based on plants I mean it's a Middle Eastern cuisine so yeah. I don't think it's completely um, different though I do see a many things that are completely different as well. I mean, the food in Israel is much bigger. You get a big plate and loads of plates with a lot of food. And in Japan, it, like everything else, which I love about Japan, it's much more subtle, <laughs> much more elegant, small dishes, True. too many sauces, you know, it's uh, the ingredients are quite similar, which yeah, I love. Like, um, there is some respect to the vegetable, like it can stand alone and it's so high quality as it is. And it's, you don't need to like make it too big and too mixed yeah. with other things. That's what I actually love in Japan as well. I agree with you, Shikma. I even think before we start a meal in Israel, you say better avon, which means eat with appetite. And in Japan, right. which is like a beautiful thing. Just thank you to everyone that brought the food to the table. And in Israel, it's like eat with appetite. Which is like... Fill up yourself, not thank you for the beautiful food. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Just bring the food. <laughs> <laughs> And bring some more if you're already next to the fridge. <laughs> oh, Takashima-san, do you think yeah. that traditional Japanese plant-based cuisines, such as shojin ryori, can be adopted and combined as fusion with the Western plant-based foods? Mm. <laughs> do you see a possibility of some fusion between traditional shojin ryori and just western food yeah but basically shojin ryori is not a complicated cuisine so it, everyone can make it and everyone can enjoy it but it's i don't know the flavor and uh, Yeah, flavor is uh, very subtle, basically, the shojin mm -hmm. ryori, not, not too salty. Yeah. And no garlic? No garlic, right? yeah. No niniku, no, no uh, uh, onion, because it's too uh, vigorous. And, yeah. and I think, the, again, the respect for each vegetable is so amazing. Um, I went to a Michelin star Shojin Ryori in Kyoto one, a few years ago. It was amazing. It's like, it's, it's very simple. Like you think Michelin yeah. star, it would be complicated, but it's not. It's simple, but extremely nice. And we should do it sometime together. Yeah, as long as you try to make it simple, I think it's, it can be adapted easily. Okay. Uh, Shikma-san, Takashima-san, both of you are serious travelers. What differences do you see, do you find when you, Shikma, compare Israel to other countries uh, relation, in relation to veganism? And you, Takashima-san, when you compare veganism in Japan to other countries? Takashima-san, you want to start? Mm -hmm. Uh, when I go to travel, especially in the U.S., I could eat everywhere because 
all the restaurant and the chefs knows what vegan is, but in Japan, most, most people don't know what exactly the vegan is. And so I have to explain what I can eat or what I can eat. So especially in the United States or you know, Australia or New Zealand, it's very easy to find a vegan food. Yes. Still in 2021, I guess. <laughs> it's just <laughs> there, right? Yeah. What about you, Shikma? How, what differences do you find in other um, places? The main difference is for me when I'm traveling is that in lots of countries, especially in the US, like in, in big cities like New York and Tokyo and London, and you can find lots of 100% vegan restaurants. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a beautiful variety. You can go to a 100% vegan restaurant, but you don't have vegan friendly restaurants that much. Mm. And in Israel, you don't have a non-vegan friendly restaurant. I mean, every restaurant here will have a vegan menu because it's so mainstream here to be vegan that you will have a separate green menu and you don't have to go to the chef or the waiter and explain what, like, even if you go down south to where my parents live, which is like really countryside, if you go to a chain, like um, any normal, you know, Cafe Nero or whatever, mm -hmm. you will find a vegan menu. Even in gas stations, you will have like a vegan sandwich. And I find that, much easier to live here in that respect that like I don't have to go to only 100% vegan restaurants I can go with my non-vegan friends to a normal restaurant and I will have a menu and um, yeah. yeah this is really amazing about Israel like there are yeah. only in Tel Aviv which is a small city after all yeah. uh, there are 400 restaurants correct me if I'm wrong Shikma that offer vegan foods yeah, so it's like it's nearly it's not... any, every, every restaurant, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should visit Takashi, Takashima san. Oh, you yeah. I will show you around. <laughs> I'll show you around. <laughs> and let's wrap it up with last uh, question. Uh, do you guys actually feel that you're part of something bigger? Shikma, do you want to answer? <laughs> I definitely feel like I'm a part of something bigger. I mean, I think we are in the middle of history being made and I really feel it as an influencer. Basically, I live veganism from the moment I wake up till the moment I go to sleep and I've been doing this for five years and I can see the change and I can see the movement around the world. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, the future is definitely vegan and it goes, it's, it's quite obviously going that way. And I, I'm really proud and I'm excited to be a part of it. I really do. <laughs> Cool. How about you, Takashima-san? Do you feel part of something bigger, much, much bigger? <laughs> I, I don't know, but considering the number of followers that I have, over 2 million, I might be affecting the world in a good way. <laughs> but I, <I'm> not <laughs> yes, you are. And your followers are from all over the world. Yeah. Most of yeah. them are not from Japan. From the US. US, yeah, 30% from US and uh, yeah, and other countries. Okay. You're, ma you're making a big difference, I'm sure. So our time is up. Thank you very much for this discussion and for your beautiful and inspiring blogs. <laughs> uh, you're definitely promoting an amazing and peaceful lifestyle that I personally hope that uh, many people will adopt. I believe that veganism has the power to actually repair the world, not less than that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Arigato gozaimashita. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sharon, Shikma, and Takashima-san. I'm a dedicated follower for years. Um, and I must say that um, I probably use your recipes uh, at least once a week. There are some that I remember by heart, but they're on my YouTube uh, channel and uh, my little boy's YouTube channels uh, constantly. So thank you very much for the great influence uh, you're doing, the beautiful job you're doing. I know how hard it is, and I know it's hard to be on the other side of the camera on live. So thank you very, very much for taking your time and participating in this webinar. It was important yeah. for us to um, not just keep the uh, speakers on the business tech level, but bring influencers and educators 
both for today's uh, webinar and for tomorrow's uh, session. Um, now we will play a plant-based food uh, tech startup speeches uh, for the next uh, 50 minutes. And uh, I am hopefully um, companies and advocates will see uh, some startups they are interested in and will be happy uh, to uh, invest. Or if you want to get in touch with one of the startups, um, please uh, find the details in our uh, website and you can connect contact them uh, directly. Saberate is a startup company developing the next generation of meat alternative product using proprietary plant-based ingredients on one hand and a smart robot on the other hand, which prepare the order automatically for forming it to grilling the final product. It all started with a discovery at the Hebrew University. We were able to develop a plant-based fiber that enable us uh, to mimic the fibrous texture of meat with the uh, robot chef that has capabilities of additive manufacturing together with the cooking uh, capabilities. And now for the first time, we're able uh, to produce at the point of sale meat-like products. We founded Saberit because we believe that something different needs to be done for our nutrition and for our environment. Tomorrow's consumer are waiting for just that. That technology has the potential to revolutionize the food industry. We are now able to reduce significantly the energy, the carbon footprint, and most importantly, it will help us to reduce food waste to keep our planet safe and sustainable. We see a rising demand for a plant-based alternative in the BBB chain. And this trend is consistently growing. BBB Group is the largest burger chain in Israel. Uh, leading in its product, looking for uh, advanced product uh, in the meat sector and uh, in the last few years in the meat alternative sector. Severit has a great product, very innovative, uh, with lots of vision, very tasty and very sexy product. The most exciting things about Severit is the option to offer the diner a personalized dish. There is no real personalization in the food sphere today, and that's exactly what we are developing. Since we started our collaboration with Severit, uh, we gained lots of PR. Many customers and potential customers are calling us and asking us about uh, this uh, meat alternative product. It gained a lot of curiosity and uh, potential customers such as flexitarians and vegetarians that we didn't have till now. Our customers in the restaurants ask us questions not to mention the uh, franchises and the managers of the restaurants. They can't wait. Join us. Join Savor It's incredible journey of creating the next food innovation. Hi, my name is Eli. I'm CEO and founder of Can Eat. Our service is for people who have food restrictions because of a religion, healthy problem, pregnancy, or allergy. In my case, my mother has a rice, tomato, kiwi allergy, and she also dislikes chicken. She always feels inconvenienced when eating out. When she orders a meal, she always has to tell the staff about her allergy and the tolerance level. She spends a lot of time 
and the staff usually makes mistakes. So can eat provides two services that anyone can arrange a menu for those with dietary restrictions. One is communication system for group dinners such as weddings, banquets, school trips, and etc. In many cases, the restaurant will ask you any dietary restrictions a few weeks in advance. You can correctly communicate your dietary restrictions with a QR code. You just follow the guide, choose your inedible food and tolerance level like this. And then you send your information, restaurant can confirm in real time. In addition, there is a dictionary where all staff, including part-time workers, can gain knowledge based on the information on allergies applied for. With this service, we prevent accident caused by communication mistakes. Not only that, non-life insurance will be applied to accidents that cannot be prevented by using this service. Another service is allergy judgment, allergy judgment service for every restaurant. Even if you can tell your information with a QR service, it is meaningless if the restaurant doesn't know the ingredients. Many people don't know that mayonnaise is made of eggs. Many people don't know that cheese is a dairy product. This service can be determined by just reading the food level with a smartphone. Then we deliver this allergen table for each menu. Food leveling in Japan is very complicated and restaurant staff often misread. But even if they don't have the knowledge, the system and the experts will support you. This is our team. I specialize in IT and data security, also in allergy-friendly food. Shintaro also has expertise in Japanese food labeling. Kyoko is a nutritionist. Our team is made up of allergy specialists. There are very few specialists who can provide allergy consulting for restaurants. So the team has strength. First of all, we are working to eliminate allergic accidents caused by eating out which is life-threatening. And by personalizing food to everyone, we will create a world where people can enjoy eating out equally, regardless of religion or constitution. I would like to ask if this service can be deployed in Israel. Please tell us about Israeli food loving and staff support. Thank you. Hello everybody, we are Tel Aviv Protein Bakery. It's a bakery run by both of us and it's located in Tel Aviv, Israel. Our bakery offers solutions, not just food. It offers solutions in fitness, solutions in nutrition for anyone who just want to maintain a healthy lifestyle but in the most easiest, fun, quick way. I'm Anastasia. I'm a scientist. I have a PhD in biochemistry from Cambridge University. While I was working on my PhD, I started lifting, became a powerlifter, and represented Great Britain at World Championships three years later. 
Well, that's cool because I'm also a pro athlete. I am Mayan and I miss Israel four times in bodybuilding, which makes me a professional athlete. So I go and represent Israel outside. Last year was New York and sometimes Italy, Euro Cup championships and all. I also coach and basically I just enjoy what I'm doing, bringing health and fun to other people. Both of us are plant-based <laughs> athletes! <laughs> In our bakery, we offer solutions to our clients to maintain a healthy lifestyle in a very easy way. That's true. That means that we don't only bake in our bakery. We are actually adjusting a client, a fitness, a fitness uh, yeah. plan, sorry, <laughs> and also a nutrition plan. And not only that, we, sub uh, we give him also a digital cookbook and we actually help them achieve their goals in the easiest way. But you know how it is. You are motivated, you have a plan, but you're just too busy. Don't worry, this time it's going to be different. That's true, because as I mentioned before, our service is more than just a piece of paper with what you need to eat or how you need to live. It's more than that. It takes your life, it takes your abilities, your resources, and it offers you something that you could actually maintain, all right? So you're not gonna be alone. You're gonna get the recipes. You're gonna get the instructions. You're gonna get advice. You're gonna get all in one place. Our meal mixture product line uh -huh. da -da. Da -da. <laughs> is designed to support your personal needs and fit into your personal plan. Another amazing thing about our products is that they have a very long shelf life. You can literally keep them forever. I will never keep them forever. I'm so hungry. <laughs> I always eat all my food. But the funniest thing that we want to tell you is that when we say plant-based, the most amazing thing we realized is that most of our clients are not even vegan. Not at all. They're not even vegetarian. They're just people who are seeing the future and saying, hey, I just want to reduce some of my meat animal uh, products consumption. Because, you know, as we see it today, where the world is going to, it's just not going to be sustainable to, uh, you know, get so many animal products because the world would just not be able to supply. We want to help you. Our meal mixture product line has is healthy, is high in quality, high in protein. Of course, it's tasty, quick and easy to prepare, and plant-based. Yes, because you don't need to worry. When, when, when you eat plant-based, most of the people are just worried. Am I going to have enough protein? Is it the right food? Is it good? Is it not? Would it be good for me? Does it serve my goals? Well, that's why we have the yeah. doctor here. <laughs> okay, doctor and, and experience. <laughs> and now our vision is to have everything in one app. That's true. Imagine that. An app that would advise you. Even if you're sitting in a restaurant, the app will tell you which of the options in front of you is the best for your tailored plan. An app that will build your plan. An app that will motivate you, show you your progress. And you could even order our stuff by a click. <laughs> so easy. But for that, we need support. <laughs> <laughs> we actually need investors. We are looking for people who share our vision. Exactly. And wanna want to step to the future with us because sooner or later people are going to want to have that as quick at home <laughs> and ready for use. <laughs> for eating. No, 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 no. These are my pancakes. Come on! <laughs> Hello, I'm Hannah Talitschak, the co-founder and CEO of ELS Nutrition. ELS is bringing the world the next generation in infant and kids nutrition. I'll start with a story told recently by Michelle, a mom of a little toddler who lives in the U.S. who uses ELS Nutrition toddler formula. My son is 18 months and is intolerant to both corn and milk. My son hasn't gained any weight and remained at 17 pounds 
for about eight months. And the doctor wrote in his notes, failure to thrive. My son has been on l Stoller formula for almost a month now. And he so far has gained two pounds and three ounces. This formula is a miracle and life changing for my son and for me. I know this is just the beginning of our journey and I look forward to continue with Else and to continue to see my son thrive. Thank you, Else. So what is Else Nutrition's value proposition? The global infant formula market is valued at $80 billion with almost 6% cater. It is mainly dominated by a single protein source, which is cow's milk, and the rest is soy protein. But both of them are very controversial and problematic. Needless to say that they are both strong allergens with residues of hormones, pesticides, GMOs, and lots of sustainability and animal welfare concerns around them. So to date, there is no viable or sustainable solution to those who can't tolerate or wish to avoid the existing market options. ELSE is actually a game changer in the baby nutrition field. It's the world's first plant-based dairy and soy-free infant formula, and it's globally patented. It's made from three plants, almonds, buckwheat, and tapioca, forming a nutritional equivalent to the human milk composition. It's 100% organic, vegan, gluten-free product, cleanest label, all natural and minimally processed with the most sustainable and minor ecological footprint and with um, great IP and technological infrastructure to become a global nutrition company. So what is a, the game changer advantage of else in a nutshell? We actually comply the strictest nutritional composition of an infant formula with a paradigm shifting protein source and processing method while avoiding the controversial proteins and overly processed ingredients. And all this is protected in a robust composition based patent portfolio with granted patents all over the world for infants as well as adult applications. This is our current product range. The toddler formula on the left is already selling in the US market for six months. And the kids nutritional drink on the right will be launched in North America by the end of this quarter. On top of complying to the baby nutrition standards, our products are certified by world-class third-party bodies to meet the world's highest safety and purity standards in the food industry. As far as our accomplishments so far, our toddler formula has been well received in the North American market and is demonstrating substantial growth week over week. It is currently selling on Amazon and other online platforms and also launched recently on our first nationwide retail natural food chain and will start rolling out into hundreds of additional doors this year. We are engaged with the largest distribution groups in our space and which potentially represent nearly 60,000 doors for else. We plan to start our clinical studies to get an FDA and European permit to sell the infant formula product this year. This is just part of our collage of marketing activities that are done with celebrity influencers online. And just the last slide would be about our corporate. So we're a publicly listed company in the Toronto Stock Exchange as since June 2019, we've raised three rounds already with over 40, 41 million Canadian dollars and that were led by Agent Age and Can Accord. Agent Age Group is actually a um, Hong Kong um, company listed in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, is a global leader in advanced baby and adult nutrition 
and actually is a, a great partner to have as um, we are engaged with them on an MOU for distribu distributing our products in their territories. I'd like to thank you all for listening to the L story and having me. These are my contact details if anyone wants to have any questions and I wish you all a great day. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maya Ashkenazi Otmazgin and I am the CEO and co-founder of Maula, Preventative Nutrition. Breastfeeding is the apex of human nutrition. By decoding its secrets, Maula harnesses its immune potential to create ingredients of tomorrow. So what exactly does Maulak do? Maulak is creating specifically formulated active immune boosting mixture to strengthen and support the immune system of all living beings. We began by mapping the composition of human milk. Next, we searched for homologs in other milk sources. These sources then became our raw material. We built an algorithm capable of learning the entire chemical physical properties of the proteins in our raw materials and predict formulation based on specification. So, for example, if I were to input the specification of an anti-inflammatory formula for athletes, let's say, the algorithm would give me a list of possible mixtures. This novel ingredient can be incorporated in a myriad of foods, supplements, pharma, and cosmetic products. This past year has sadly brought to the forefront the importance of maintaining a strong immune system. Our diet and what we choose to put inside our body has a direct impact on our immune system. It has become increasingly clear to consumers that impact nutrition is undeniably a necessity. Maulak is leveraging an existing nutritional need to open up the food market for biofunctional ingredients. Why us, you ask? We are the ones that believe that the answers lie within our own biology. Maulak is patent pending and is currently building its first pilot. We, as a B2B company, are looking to supply our novel functional ingredients to a variety of markets. On behalf of Maulak team, thank you all for watching. Bye. Hello everybody, my name is Daniel, I am from Israel, today I am businessman, my company called Top Def. Good morning, my name is Willem Laux, I am living for more than 30 years in Israel, I was born in Holland, I am here a well known sports trainer, especially for athletics, physical education and running, and I am also educator of trainers here. I want to tell you something about TEF. Yeah, from TEF you can make a lot of things. Most of the people in Ethiopia, they of course they make from TEF injera. Injera is a special pancake. It's rich of minerals, rich of vitamins, gluten free, and it's very easy for the digestion. But now we have made something special. It's called Instant TEF. It's made by the Israeli Top TEF company. Yeah, normally, it takes about three days until the batter is ready. And with this new instant tef, you only have to add a little bit water. Then you put the batter on a special injera maker. Within three, three minutes, 
the pancake, the injera is ready. On the injera, you can add whatever you want, like you can add fresh vegetables, sauces, you can add sauces from lentils. If you eat meat, you can add meat and then you can eat it. It's very easy with a digestion and very tasteful and very healthy. And we know that the Ethiopian long distance runners, all of them they eat teff and also the people in Ethiopia, but more and more people all over the world are going to eat teff. And nowadays it's very important that we eat more and more healthy. So what I recommend it is really to eat teff. Thank you very much. The real injera revolution. See this instant injera. You put only a little bit water, then you put it here, and within two minutes the injera is ready. And it's so tasteful, and it's also powerful. And you see here the result. This look. Normally it takes three or four days until it's ready, and now within a couple of minutes it's ready because of the instant injera. You can eat in this. It's good for everybody. Okarada, sustainable and new. Okarada, sustainable and nutritious food. Development project. Hello, my name is Eric Kubo. Today I'm here to talk about my Okara business. A global issue food loss and waste. Four years ago, we focused on environmental problems and healthy food. That picture is global issue food loss and waste. Discarded food maybe cost one trillion yen a year to burn it up. The FAO recommends the production of the protein-rich beans. So we decided to make products with okara that is traditional Japanese food and rich in nutrition. Japanese traditional food, okara. One of top shops suggests me dry okara powder that contain 50% fiber and 20% protein. Only one tenth carbon hydrate as flour does. But in Japan, 70 metric tons okara was wasted every year. That's why value wasted. Okara is traditional, but very functional food. Okara powder contain adiponectin that is diet hormone. So you eat okara powder, you will be able to stabilize your sugar intake. Weak point of existing okara cookies. There are already okara products sold in Japan. I have tried and tasted them and the quality is not very good in my opinion. So I decided to improve on what was already available and develop those okara bars and biscuits. There are two problems. Using only okara powder products are not in good taste, texture, and difficult to swallow. Other products mix with flour for better taste and texture, but they are increased carbs and sugar. So we decided to make special Okara product. Strong point of our Okara products. One, we don't use wheat flour for gluten-free and increase the carbs and sugar. Two, use natural materials because when I get some bar at shop, I always check ingredients Promotion written on front side of package is you can get one day's worth of vegetables, but the back of the package ingredients, they put a lot of chemicals. No, I don't like it. Three, we use paper package for eco friends. Four, 
most important things is delicious uh, products or Canada bar and biscuits. Finally, earlier this year, my husband achieved both good taste and pleasant texture without gluten-free, high in fiber, and low in carbs, low in sugar, no chemicals. Anyway, it's really delicious because my husband has been making bread dough for nearly 30 years, including during his training. So I made use of that experience to succeed in commercializing gluten-free products. With just one bar, you feel full so you'll be able to eat less than you normally do, which can also help with your diet. Dr. Shi Labo introduced our products. Currently, we are selling Dr. Shi Labo that is cosmetic company belonging to Johnson and Johnson. Their customer is very delicate of their skin, so they want to improve of inside of body. The bar and biscuits are selling much better than expected. Our product has also been decided as a gift for the hometown tax in Suita City our sustainable and plant-based business. Someday, craft beer company asked me that they have leftover problem about beer proof. So we tried to make beer proof bar and biscuit. That was tasty too. Then check up other leftover foods, wine, Japanese sake, whiskey. They tend to be throw away despite their high nutritional value. We want to grow upcycling business to make eco-friendly product. Ideal business partners for expand our operation. We want to collaborate with natural supermarket in Israel. Thank you for your time. Zev from... We will play Kitchen Robotics. Hey everyone, I'm Zev from Kitchen Robotics Israel, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you all for your time. Kitchens haven't changed in centuries. They are exactly the same as they've been for so long. Chopping, cooking, cutting, washing, drying, again and again. It's the same old problems, the dull and repetitive manual labor and its high intensity, the poor profit margins, which, which make this industry such a great challenge to succeed in. The lack of scalability, quality issues, and hygiene difficulties as well. This market is undergoing a massive disruption as we speak with dark kitchens or restaurants geared towards takeaway with no brick, brick and mortar locations, they're popping up all over the world in, in a market estimated to pass $1 trillion in the next five years. Virtual restaurants and restaurants that had no previous branding. And of course, the DSPs that are taking up such a large chunk of the profitability are really changing the way this market operates. So we're introducing Bistro, the first robotic dark kitchen. At two by three meters, it freshly prepares and cooks 60 dishes per hour. And the meals are ready just in time for your order. We have 40 ingredients capacity, which can handle dry, solid, semi-solids, liquids, etc. Once the dish is prepared, the pot rolls down to the serving area where the employee can package it for takeaway or dish it for service. And there, then the pot goes into the cleaning unit where it's automatically and hygienically cleaned after every single round of cooking. It's a very cost-effective solution. It reduces employee count by typically by over 50% and significantly reduces labor costs. It has a minimal footprint and so is an excellent solution for food trucks. It fits in a 20-foot container. 
It allows restaurants to scale quite easily and rapid, rapidly from one location to another. Installation takes, you know, less than one day. It integrates with all major takeaway DSPs and handles supply ordering, etc. Consistency is one of the main points I would stress because it's emphasized by every single culinary expert we've worked with. Having the dish taste the same no matter which shift is running or which location or branch uh, restaurant this is in. So the bistro handles that very, very well. It's a low capex expenditure, affordable for, for the industry at under $7,500 per month with no additional payments. Um, and of course our proprietary software suite handles order prediction, waste prediction, cost management, and a lot of AI behind the scenes in that one. As far as the roadmap, we had a really, really strong finish for Q4 of 20. We opened our assembly plant in the US and our first units are actually rolling out as we speak. So this is an incredible month for us here at Kitchen Robotics. Um, and we're entering a pilot phase with a very, very major player in the food industry in the United States. Q3 and Q4 are geared towards expansion along the East Coast of the US. And, you know, we'll take it from there. The sky's the limit. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Food and beverage is a big change in the world. Door dash, Grab Hub, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, and the delivery service of the support of the dining restaurant, Dark Kitchen, and the delivery of 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 the d 世界最初のロボティックダークキッチンであるビーストローを発表できることを誇りに思いますあらゆる種類の料理に対し完全にプログラムや調整パーソナライズが可能なのです簡単でフレンドリーな操作ー AI を搭載した広範囲なクラウドベースのオペレーティングシステムそしてもちろんダークキッチンスと完全に共用可能フードレストラン業界の未来を形成するために今日参加してください I would like to thank all companies that send their video and I will share one of the comments Um, says that there was a famous incident in the Lago Foie that the girl was allergic to nuts and got the wrong chocolate and died as a result. Really sad. They can eat up, killed hell. Yes, we see that um, in the food tech, um, it's not just in the case of uh, creating a new plant based food, but it's also for people that are allergic. To certain foods, they want to avoid some foods, uh, those texts uh, can help a lot. And uh, thank you for the comment. Another question that was uh, asked is where are we going to, uh, where is the link to the page where you can contact the panelists and the startup companies? We will send a thank you email to all attendees and we will put all the links uh, in the email. We will forward it after the two days uh, webinar. Thank you all for the comments and questions. Next, um, last but not least, uh, I would like to invite Noa Meidan, our precious intern, to moderate the last panel by IJ Win Founders, tips on entering Japanese and Israeli markets. I guess this session will be very um, useful, mainly for uh, students that I see that are attending to this uh, seminar. Um, please take notes. And if you have any questions, please write it down in the Q&A uh, function. Uh, we will be more than happy to answer every question uh, you have for fruitful discussion. No, the stage is yours. Thank you, Adas. Uh, I'd like to introduce IJ Win. IJ Win was established in uh, 2019 with Israelis and Japanese women living in Israel to promote business and culture among women. The network uh, expands to Japan with more than 50 members within it, conducting webinars and meetups, as well as hosting Japanese companies' delegations. The founders of IJ Win will present you some useful tips for Japanese and Israeli companies 
doing business together and for understanding each other better. Now I'd like to in, in, introduce our fun, founders. Tomoko Nakamura Yossin. Tomoko has been connecting business between Japan and Israel since 1989. Tomoko is the president of Tona Jo Consultant LTD. Tomoko has rich business experiences and speak Japanese, Hebrew, and English. Shira Prion, working in Weiss Porat & Co. A law firm, responsible for, Japan, uh, for the Japan desk. She has a Japanese mother and an Israeli father, born in Japan and raised in Japan. Uh, born in Israel and raised in Japan. Naomi Azar Nakashima, working as a freelance uh, consultant for Japanese and Israeli companies for collaboration. Japanese Hebrew translator. Uh, and Yuiko Kobayashi, has been working with leading Israeli companies as well as several technological startups for many years and has been a great resource for Israeli companies that want to expand their business to the Japanese market. And now I will present the most common questions about the subject. You are welcome to add more questions on the chat and we will try to answer them all. Uh, so the first question is the why are Israelis asking a lot of personal questions to Mokosan on Nagashimas? Thank you, uh, Nora. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Tomoko Nakamura Yosting. I came to Israel in 1977, long time ago. It was a different world from today. Uh, and I started business between Japan and Israel since 1989, Japan was a bubble and it was full of money and I helped a lot to um, Israel company to into Japanese market. Um, but Japanese doesn't want to business with Israelis so much directly because of the Arab boycott. And I helped um, also um, Okinawa prefecture to uh, agriculture technologies. They are interested and in it was very successful. And um, because Japanese and Israel are so different people, maybe the opposite. That's why if you try to business together, it helps each other. The most best way to understand and to help cooperate. Maybe this is the best um, match if you understand to each other. And uh, here I want to help you uh, about the uh, noise question. Uh, unlike Japanese people, Israeli people have very direct relationship and communication. The Japanese society is a vertical society and the Israeli society is a horizontal society. Therefore, in Israel, Israeli can speak politely sometimes, but they do not use Keigo, honorific properly, depending on the, the other person you speak. Israeli are so close to each other that they make friends right away. But sometimes they get too close and bother you. Yep. Japanese people are not good at refusing directly. But in Israeli, it is not rude to express their intention to dislike what they dislike. Even just you met first time, Israel can ask you how much is your salary? You may be asked this kind of surprising question. At such time, you can smile and say clearly that you, can ans you can't answer. Though it doesn't have to happen, of course. So be free and you can say with smile, I don't want to ask her this question, it's fine. Thank you, Nora. I finished. Okay, thank you, Tomoko-san. 
Uh, so the second question is, how do you prepare yourself for a meeting with an Israeli company, Yuriko-san or Negaishimas? Hi, my name is Yuriko Kobayashi. I've been working for and supporting many Israeli technological based companies. And before I moved to Israel, I was in the United States and I'm working for also uh, technological um, American companies. Okay, so to um, give my contribution about the question, how to prepare, this is more like a tip for Japanese companies. Um, I imagine that the, today audiences, some of them already have some experiences communicating with Japanese Israeli companies and some are new to this field. Um, and just to make my point clear in a short time, because there are so many things we can talk about in terms of communication preparation entering to Japanese, a Japanese company, for a Japanese company entering the Israeli market. Um, two things, um, way of communication are so different in two, two countries, and also um, making decision processes. So in, from those two point of view, the thing that I would like to suggest for a Japanese company is to set the clear purpose or goal before you entering or approaching to Israeli companies, whether that is just uh, learning about the market or maybe um, looking for certain technologies. This will set to the certain tone for the expectations for both sides. And again, also Tomoko-san said to be clear with your communication so that um, both sides are clear in terms of communication. Uh, some of the things that you might be experiencing in terms of um, communicating with Israeli companies in the beginning, it might be like very enthusiastic reactions you might get from Israeli side. And, or sometimes there's no response through your emails or contacting. So there might be high and low throughout your communication with Israeli companies. So you want to be in a position you can, you manage the communication with Israeli companies. Um, so those are the two tips that I would like to say for a Japanese company to prepare before you enter into or communicating with Israeli companies. Pass it to you, Noah-san. Thank you very much, Yuriko-san. Uh, the next question is how do you deal with the Israelis when they uh, ask about the cooperation? Naomi san and Gashimas. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm now Mia Zarna Kashima. Um, I also live in Israel for more than 25 years. Also, I am, I am working as freelance and have a lecture on Japanese or Israeli business culture or help the both country that want to go into the market of both country. Um, as the Tomoko-san says before, I also think that Israeli and Japanese has the really opposite uh, culture. And, um, but uh, that's why I believe that both sides can study each other. And I always try to take good behavior from both, like uh, be energish as Israeli, but be polite as Japanese. OK, so I will answer the North questions. Um, how do I deal with the Israeli when they ask me about our co-op? Okay, uh, I often get consultation from Israeli about uh, email communication with Japanese companies, such as the difficulty from receiving a reply from Japanese company. So what I want to say to Japanese companies, once you asked to meet or to have connection with Israeli companies like startups, please do not disappear and please do not ignore their email. And uh, it's happened. It's happened sometimes, uh, unfortunately. So um, they are waiting for your reply. Uh, if you do not have any decision yet, please tell them that. Hi, we will still, we still have no decision yet. It's enough good. And this short message makes trust much more than you think or if, unfortunately, the cooperation is not acceptable, please tell them that. No is also the answer too, just not uh, disappeared, please. Uh, very short messages are okay. Not perfect English is much, much better and polite than no reply. 
Please remember, quick and clear messages are very important for any businesses in Israel. And if the messages are honest, I think Israelis even love it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi-san. Uh, so do you guys have any more, anything more to add about the Japanese companies for working with Israelis or can I go to the next part? I think uh, the contract issue is uh, important for Japanese companies. Uh, big company and international uh, companies are regular, but the medium and small companies are not regular to make contract before starting business. I would like to open the, between us uh, to help them uh, how it can be better to contract. Okay, so if I may um, add here, um, so my name is uh, Shira Purion. I work as um, a lawyer at uh, Vice Park and Co. Uh, I'm responsible for a Japan Desk at the, the firm. We represent Japanese companies in the, uh, in Israel uh, as well as the Israeli companies that want to penetrate to Japanese market. So a uh, contract is very uh, different meaning for Japanese companies and the Israeli companies. For Japanese companies, as you said, the Tomoko-san, um, bigger uh, companies and entities, they take more uh, seriously the contract. But for a medium and a small size um, companies, the contract is just a beginning of a relationship. And it's kind of a, uh, what it's written in contract is kind of just a su suggestion. So um, the Israeli size, they, um, they uh, very stick to what it's written in contract, but the Japanese companies, the Japanese partners, they said, okay, it's written in contract, but we're just building our relationship. So, um, so if sometimes uh, the situation uh, changes, we can uh, also uh, change our um, business uh, partnership um, conditions. And uh, sometimes it makes it uh, more difficult for Israeli um, partners. Um, and also um, Israeli size, they think um, of this contract uh, also to until the end of the, the collaboration. So if some, something happens, um, they will put all the um, matters. But that Japanese side, they, they see the partnership for very long term. And if something happened in the middle of the way, um, they will not go uh, to, to break the contract right away, uh, rather than they maybe to, um, to to go over and uh, make up with the with the other side. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And now the questions are for Israeli companies about how to enter the, uh, the Japanese market. So the first question is: How do you prepare yourself for, for a meeting with a Japanese company? Tomoko san um, Hi, the Japanese side wants a lot of information before starting an actual business. Get ready and have as much digital and printed information about your company as possible before you first speak. That information will determine your company. Uh, when and by whom your company was founded. And why? How many years have they passed since the company was established? The history of the company since its establishment, the location of, your, of the company, capital, turnover, number of employees, etc. All as much as you can imagine and if you can collect many, as much as many is better. And how long is your company over other companies in the same industry? 
also prepare who is your customer. Um, if you give many information, it helps your company that the Japanese company can decide better how start and how cooperate with your company. This is my recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tomoko-san. And the next question is, how do I deal uh, with the culture differences? And are women supposed to join for drinks, for the Nomikai? Uh, Yuiko-san and Shira-san on Okay, thank you, Noah. Um, this is a very sexy question. <laughs> So generally speaking, there are no differences doing business between men and women, as both sides have the same goal to collaborate and do business. But this answer may change if you ask men or women. Japanese business culture in the high level or in the big companies in Japan are still men's world. And the business scene is mostly dominated by males. One important point of business culture is do, going to drink together and crack the ice on both sides. Usually women join, join to this dinner and maybe to the second stage of going to drink alcohol, but sometimes they prefer to go to a gentleman club and ask the woman participant to go home or to hotel. From my personal um, uh, experience, I can share that there was a very nice uh, sushi dinner that we had with our um, clients, Japanese clients in Japan. And um, after, the, after this uh, uh, dinner, they invited the taxi and they just waited for me to go up uh, to taxi and go to hotel. And they just um, uh, continued to um, to the second stage uh, of uh, going uh, drinking alcohol. Um, I guess it was in a um, in gentleman uh, club. Um, so I understand and I just uh, went to hotel. Yuko-san. Hi, thank you Shira-san for sharing your experience and your point of view. Um, something that I can add um, for also being female and a male, but um, first of all, having a dinner, lunch with Japanese people or business dinner or the beginning of the relationship for the business is very important. For, also for Japanese doing business with Japanese. So I would say this is the opportunity for anyone, also female business professionals, to um, start the trust for a relationship with the Japanese contact person or the group. So you can jump on this opportunity if you'd like. And if you feel that, as Shira-san said, that maybe some of the groups very much dominated by a male uh, in Japan, certain business scenes, and you might feel that a little bit um, hesitant from the other party, maybe you are the one that can take the initiative and ask for a uh, suggestion for dinner, lunch, coffee, any like share the time is I think is very important. Um, and the, um, also prepare yourself for subjects to talk about. I mean, you share the drinks or coffee or tea or karaoke and, um, you know, start trying to close the deal during those dinner um, is the other one extreme, which you want to avoid. On the other hand, you, you don't want to go to start talking about your very personal things during those things. So I guess you have to stay in the middle, more balanced, and you want to know what kind of life you have, what kind of person you are, uh, the purpose of this meeting is to show who you are, how confident you are, how comfortable you are. Um, because at the end of this long courtship in the beginning, if everything goes well, this is, you're the person who would be contacting, you would be the main contact person or dealing with technical questions or business issues with uh, your Japanese counterpart. So the key um, words I would contribute here would be some be mindful of cultural differences and being different gender and stay professional and but still be a, a approachable, somebody that you can approach and then ask questions or consult. 
So these are the three things for take home from my uh, contribution. Okay, thank you, Yuriko-san and Shira-san. Uh, the next question is, why aren't Japanese asking any questions in meeting? Naomi-san, Hi. Uh, before I start to answer that question, I just want to add something about the question that we talked before just right now about the uh, uh, woman, if it's got better to go to Nomikai and uh, everything like we uh, talk about it a lot before we start this uh, panel discussion and uh, things that uh, I think that the uh, environment for the Japanese woman in the business world is not uh, easy. It's, it's very, very complicated. And I can't say nothing just right now in short sentence. It's very wrong story. And we didn't have any one answer. Um, but I just want to, it's before the, the uh, International Women Day uh, soon. And I want to say for the Japanese and also Israeli woman as um, one of the member of IJ Win, uh, I like to um, see the Japanese woman will also come to Israel and uh, to be the important person in the business. Um, and uh, for that, I like to really uh, support each other and try to help each other. Um, uh, that's it. Okay, so just I come back the, before that question that you asked me, why aren't they ask any question in, in, in meeting the Japanese? Okay, so um, I think the question, this question is involved to the one of the very interesting culture in Japanese and also one of the big difference between Japan and Israel. Uh, of course, not all of them, but most of the meetings in companies in Japan are become very formality. It's a kind of a form. They have decision outside of the working time, such as nomikai, uh, that we are talking about it here, or important questions are already asked and answered at the time of nemawashi which is the kind of preparation for the new project or a new decision that is very popular things to do in Japanese company. Most of Japanese do not like to discuss matter in front of the people or even express their opinion. Japanese things argue to someone or even asking the question in front of the people is not polite. So at the meeting, if you hear silence or no questions from Japanese side, uh, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean the meeting is not going well. And I have one tip for Israeli startups or Israeli companies. For Japanese, it is very important and very usual. The meeting it goes smoothly without any fault, no argument, even no questions. So I know for Israeli, the meeting is place to discuss, talk, ask the question and even argue each other. So um, small change in the meeting, time schedule, etc., is nothing special. This is the big difference between Israel and Japan. So make Japanese a little bit calm down. Please prepare the meeting before it starts. Uh, but be sure, just be sure where is the PowerPoint file that you want to show them and uh, it is works on the screens and so on. Small things that you can do it before the meeting start, it is not sure to make Japanese ask question or express their opinion, unfortunately, but it can make the Japanese to trust you. And to make Japanese asking the question is in front of first met people and in not their mother tongue, not in Japanese. It is not easy mission, I think, but please remember the way to conversation of Japanese and Israeli is not same. Do not push them too much. Pull them, pull them softly and gently. And I hope we can have interesting and good conversation and get interesting questions from Japanese. That's it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi-san. Uh, the next question is, how do I make my presentations more accessible? Uh, Shira-san on Negaishimas? Okay. So uh, it's better to translate your company information into Japanese. Um, it would make it easier to process a lingi. Uh, it is the decision-making process in Japan. Most of Japanese companies, business, business unit people, will have no problem with reading and speaking English. So for sending the first approach, it is okay to send it in English. Japanese companies making decision press process called uh, lingi, meaning making a consensus within the company. So one idea will go around the several different departments and not everyone have good level of English. So if you want to shorten this time consuming process, you should translate the material to, to Japanese. Okay, uh, and another question for you is how do I, how do they, uh, they would handle uh, emails properly? Okay, so if you wish to receive a feed feedback, you need patience and maybe some more of it. They will take the time to reply. They will need time for doing homework and we do it uh, consulting with other departments. The contact person does not have the mandate to give any comments on the meeting in regards to the material you have sent because he does not want to make, take a responsibility of his action. He needs the other, uh, other end in the company to give the final decision. Pushing them to receive a feedback right after the meeting is pointless. Just wait for a couple of weeks and then make a kind follow up to hear if there is any process or if they need any more information. But Japanese partners, when they, they start the collaboration, they may be more faster, uh, faster than the Israeli side. So because Japanese, they will make all the plan, every step for every person in this process. So they will know uh, who will do and what at what time. So um, because the uh, Israeli side is not uh, process oriented, so they don't know um, to, to raise their um, uh, taste. So sometimes the Japanese side will ask so many questions and they want to, to go forward uh, when the Israeli side is sometimes uh, not ready for, uh, for the Japanese market of the perfect um, uh, demand of the, the product. Because Jap um, Israeli side, they can go to the market with some bags um, and so. So be prepared to Japanese market. And I just want to add that um, to go to a Japanese market, um, it is um, a tip for Israeli uh, side. Um, you need to prepare um, to go to Japanese market. And sometimes you need uh, someone um, to know how to penetrate to Japanese, to Japanese um, market. So um, I recommend to take uh, someone and, and uh, consult them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shira-san. And now I have a question of my own. I'm a student of the Ibu University, uh, Asia Studies, specializing in Japan Studies. Uh, I would like to work in Israel-Japan market. Do you have any tips on how can I use my academic study, studies and become a mediate person between Israeli companies and Japanese companies? So I can start with this one. I suppose this is um, academic studies. Depending on your academic studies, if this is more connected with social or relationship or psychology business, you can back up 
you can use these skills and the knowledge. If it's more specific, maybe your academic studies focused on medicine or medical, um, and this is the, the course of a uh, line that you want to persuade, then you can also, there's a field actually, uh, medical um, technology field going on, uh, a lot going on between Japan and Israel. So first of all, you can um, start as a general, or you can focus on the backed up with your specific background in your academic um, experience. Um, first of all, we have so many webinars and uh, so many um, events going on, meetup, also government places, um, JETRO, of course, and uh, Israeli and Japanese embassies in both places. These are places to, to start. You can get all the information and also sign up for um, uh, the, this kind of, um, for example, IG Women, we also send all the information. So you should be part of this uh, network, LinkedIn, and then slowly you will start to see similar faces. You start to see some of the organization being very active, many lawyer firms, and slowly you can be connected to some of the events or some of the companies. Everything starts with person-to-person -person business. So with the event, or the information, you'll get access to a right person. This is my part. Back to Noah-san. Okay, thank you very much, yuriko -san. Uh, Would you like to add something before I ask the question from the audience, one of you? No? Okay, uh, so the first question is, uh, what would be the best way to make a uh, personal friendly relationships with Japanese business people? Okay, I will take this um, this part. Um, so I think uh, Japanese, um, um, they are very, uh, nowadays they are very uh, curious to know uh, other, other people from other countries. And um, um, it's, 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 it's a different um, than uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago that they were very shy to talk in English or they, were, uh, they, don't, they didn't know how to uh, approach to uh, foreigners. Um, so I think just um, you can uh, invite after the meeting to go to um, to drink a coffee, uh, maybe to ask him um, what is their hobby. Um, not asking uh, personal uh, questions, but uh, to ask about their hobby is a very good way to get close to um, the other person. And um, and uh, maybe if you have if you are in a business trip in Japan and you have a free time on the weekends, maybe or. Um, after the meetings, um, you can invite uh, your Japanese partner to go to um, maybe to trip, uh, to a small uh, sightseeing together. Um, I think you can uh, very um, freely ask um, uh, the Japanese person um, or when if they are um, in their business trip in Israel. So you can also um, invite them um to to enjoy uh, time together okay thank you shirasan and uh, the next question is can i share personal details about myself when i'm making business with japanese companies or it might be considered rude can you repeat the, the question again no Hassan, just be... yes uh, can I can I share personal details about myself when I'm making business with Japanese companies, or it might be considered rude? I can start with and pass it on to another IJ Women uh, members. But uh, first of all, it's a little bit limited uh, uh, information. So, uh, personal information means your personal telephone number or email, besides your business information. Is this the uh, situation? I think it depends, not all, all people the same and our situation is different. Not so one can, answer. Yeah, so we can hypothetically, 
well, doing any other businesses, I think it's no exception with Japanese or Israeli. I think um, you need to be mindful, uh, uh, depending on the situation. And uh, also, um, uh, depends on your, your, your personal, what is your, um, where you belong to and what the other person is belonging to and what's the purpose of doing exchanging your exchanging or giving your uh, your personal is it because you need to be in touch close because you have some some info basically information you need to get from the other person besides work or academic so um um anybody else no, uh, I, I don't think, yeah, it's, of course it depends. Yes, of course it depends on the situation. This depends on the person. Yes, but I don't think it's, um, it's so rude. Rude is a little bit strong word. And if the, if the, how do you say, if it's come from the, to be good friend or to have a good communications, and sometimes maybe Japanese feel that it's, too much privacy or as we talked before, uh, but usually what I see here in Israel or also in Japan that the Israeli went to Japan and sometimes they bring them to, to their home or another time that Japanese come to Israel and some Israelis invite them to their home. Both of them, I saw they are really enjoying that and have very good time together. Um, so of, of course it is depend on, and I have to see all the time what a situation, but I don't think it will be rude so much. Just both of both sides have to say, if it's too much, just say, no, it's enough. And then to be honest and to be, how do you say, good together, each other, not too much. And then not uh, try to do something bad, I mean, and I don't think it will never rude. Yes, and you can always start starting. I would like to be polite, or I'd, I'd like to avoid being rude. But so there's a, this kind of sentence starting. Uh, but I want to be clear, or I'm wondering if we, this is possible. So the other person has more mind to listen to you and then make a decision. Or you can say no to me, but I'd like to ask so and so. So the other person feels comfortable saying no, right? So creating a very comfortable communication environment. Yeah, I, I want to say for the, for the Japanese that they not be afraid to say no. It's really usual to, to get answer no. It's not something special, but for Japanese, sometimes it's hard to say no, especially then when they are trying to be kind to you. But uh, if it's no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you diffuse his uh, personality or something like that. Yeah, this is uh, difficult for Japanese to say no when uh, the other side expects a an yes answer. This is, uh, it takes time for Japanese, but uh, they should know. You can say no if you have right no answer. So this comes back to also this making decision processes so different in two different company, any countries in business-wise. In, in Israel, each person might be given a certain level of authority to be able to decide and proceed with the project. Whereas in Japan, in, as the company size grows, it's a process, internal process they need to go through to get yes or no or hold about the project. So. Um, so that's why it's good to be clear for Japanese side to be uh, for, for Israeli that, for example, I'm, uh, I'm doing scouting for so and so timeline could be maybe not soon or long term, or I'm not the uh, decision maker. So please give us some time. So this small line might be help to set the expectation with Japanese uh, Israeli companies. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so we are out of time. Thank you very much all the IJ Win founders. Uh, and you are all welcome to ask other questions on our, our forum uh, in the website. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you very much for your inputs and insights. Um, it reminds me that uh, three months ago, uh, we had this uh, panel uh, discussion at the Hebrew University with the uh, alumni that working uh, in Japan and established their own business in Japan. And I think that the main conclusion that everyone says is that you must know the culture if you wanna have business, if you wanna have good relations. And you just proved that the most important thing in business between two nations, it's an understanding of the culture. And I highly invite everyone, uh, first of all, to approach you to learn more about uh, Japan and more learn about Israel because you, four of you, are the bridge between Israel and Japan. You know both cultures into details and this is very important. Thank you very, very much for your insights. And now uh, we, I will uh, invite uh, Sherman Almog, IG Win member, uh, to have the last um, but not least um, interview with parliament member Miki Chaimovich. Sharon, the stage is yours. Thank you, Adas. Hello, Ms. Chaimovich. Hello, 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 everybody. <laughs> I'd like first to apologize that I wasn't uh, here before, but uh, due to a very emergency uh, discussion I had in my committee uh, regarding uh, terrible uh, pollution in our sea in the last uh, two weeks, and uh, I apologize for, for that. And I'm really happy to be here. I'm a big fan and admirer of Japan, of the culture and everything, including the food. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Really, we uh, much appreciated that you decided to join like later on, not on the schedule. I really appreciate it. So earlier today, we had a discussion panel with the vegan friendly uh, CEO Omri Paz mm -hmm. and uh, with the Dikla Montague from uh, the Kitchen Hub. And we discussed about activism mm -hmm. and the triangle of legislation, business and society and the communication between the sides. Mm -hmm. So you're <laughs> coming from the legislation side, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I would like to introduce you again. I did it on the other panel, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but you were not there. So now I, I'd like to introduce you again. So... Uh, Ms. Miki Chaimovich, uh, Israeli Member of Parliament, Chair of the 23rd Knesset's Interior and Environmental Protection Co Committee, former journalist, TV news anchor, and activist leader for the environment and animal rights. Previously, she launched Meatless Monday in Israel and oversaw its adoption in numerous corporations, organizations, and agencies. You did a lot, really a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, and still and do. And I intend to do more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inside the Knesset or from the outside. You can always Thank make you. an inference. Thank you so much. So let's go to the first question. Um, what are the main difficulties in legislation when it comes to environmental protection? What's happening in the world in regards mm -hmm. Which countries have a good model, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in uh, one of the main problems regarding uh, environmental protection uh, in Israel is the structure of the Israeli government. Uh, we have the Ministry of uh, Environmental Protection, which is one of the smallest ministries in the government. I just came from this uh, discussion that we have and it, 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 it was one of the proofs that, that we don't have enough manpower, we don't have enough budget to deal with such a pollution, a big pollution that we have now in the sea. This is one of the biggest problems. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of budget and surely manpower. And um, it's also, you know, uh, for many years to be the minister of the environment, uh, environmental protection was like uh, not a very uh, uh, wanted uh, position because it's considered to be a very small uh, office and it shouldn't be like that. It should be the opposite. As in my point of view is that it's one of the most important 
um, uh, offices in, in the government regarding especially what we are facing uh, the, the climate uh, crisis. Um, exactly. So, I would think it's like so attractive. <laughs> and me too. I, this, is, this is why I entered politics and this is, was my aim. I, was, I wanted to be the, the minister of, uh, of environment. But unfortunately, you know, in politics, you don't always get what you want. Uh, and um, so I ended uh, being the chairman of the, of the committee, which was also a very strong position to do uh, the different uh, legislations and the, and the other moves that, uh, that they could. But unfortunately, it was a very uh, short, short time. And um, I had so much more uh, things that I wanted to do that I didn't have the, the time to, to do. But if we're talking about, well, I, I, I'm not sure that I can really, you know, um, I, and I really don't know how all the countries in the world are dealing with uh, um, environmental issues. Uh, but, you know, we, we, um, we usually, um, uh, if, if we take the, the USL, USA, for example, the United States, you know, despite the, the bad record that they have, in dealing with environmental issues, uh, especially uh, the, in the last uh, four years of the Trump uh, administration, uh, still they do have a, a strong government agencies like mm -hmm. FEMA mm -hmm. uh, with uh, broad powers and, uh, and big budgets. And, um, and, and we see now, uh, if we take, uh, uh, for example, the decision of the new elected uh, President uh, Biden to appoint climate experts in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in the National Security Council, in the Ministry of Finance, and in the Ministry of, of Transport. This is an example how things are, should be handled in this time that we are in the time of uh, climate crisis. Because this is something that is, it, it, it's in all the offices, it should be like maybe under, you know, in Israel, it's mm -hmm. the prime minister, in other places, it's the, it's the president. This is something that should be above all the, minister, the other ministries because it should, it, it requires coordination between the, the different uh, offices. And this is something that I think is understood now in the, in the world. And this is the, the, diff, the, the, the change of strategies that should be taken in, in countries regarding the, 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 the climate crisis, because we, we every, every, every office, if it's the health uh, uh, department uh, or it, if it's the transport or any, any other, has a, an impact on the climate crisis. And everyone should make their uh, programs and, and, uh, and long-term uh, um, strategy regarding the climate crisis. So it should have like an above uh, overview and, and management out in all the offices. I think this is the, the attitude that should be taken uh, regarding the legislation and, uh, and the way uh, countries should uh, uh, refer to the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, tell me something, under the umbrella of the committee, there are some very acute matters, as we see now. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that plant-based food issues uh, get enough volume? Are you able to promote uh, 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 like plant-based food awareness as much as other well, topics? Unfortunately, not. Um, first of all, because uh, all the whole matter of uh, plant plant-based food is under the agriculture ministry which is not under my committee. Mm -hmm. and, um, but since I'm a very known vegan in Israel and spoke a lot about it everywhere I go and still asked about it every time I'm interviewed. And you know, one of the most, uh, the first, one of the th first things I did when I entered the Knesset was asking to replace my yes. seat. Yes, Which please tell it. this story. Please tell okay. this story. I was debating if to ask you, so if you brought it up, so. <laughs> so, well, once I entered the Knesset, I realized that the seats that were sitting in, in, the, in the big hall are uh, covered with, um, with leather, uh, deer leather. Deer leather. Apparently. 
which yeah. is horrible. And I'm as a very strict vegan, I'm not uh, wearing and I'm not using any leather stuff at all, not bags, not shoes, uh, of course, not the seat in my car. Uh, and I'm very, uh, this is part of my life. And it really bothered me the idea that I'm going to sit for four years. This was the time that I still, I was still hoping that we will stay four years in the Knesset. But so I, I, um, I applied to the uh, chairman of the Knesset and asked him to replace the cover of the seat with artificial leather, that it will look the same, you know, because we, we know that you can find artificial leather in all uh, kinds of uh, very good quality. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's a matter of, it's like a belief. It's like, a, I, and I felt that, uh, and I even offered to pay for it from my money. So they, it will not, uh, but, but I got, uh, they refused to do it. Brutal. And, and it was, you know, I got a lot of media attention then. Some people mocked me and some people said, what is she dealing with? It's not important, but I think that's something that you believe in and if you're going with it, so you should stand by it. And uh, for me, it was important. Yeah, and, it raises and, up uh, some awareness. And... Exactly. So it was discussed a lot. And I think, yes, one of the, one of the good things that happened with it was that it, it became, people became aware because people really don't mm, really... Exactly think about when they sit on a chair or a sofa and they really don't think what is what is it made of and i explained that it's not that if, if i go to a, a house and there's a sofa made of leather of course i will sit because I, i'm a guest but this was supposed to be my chair for the next four years which is something that is identified with me so i thought that it's a worth uh, um uh, that this is something that should be, uh, I think, changed. And then um, maybe someday it will, it will maybe in the next Knesset, because there are, I think, about now, about five vegan uh, Knesset members. Mm. And I don't know how many will be in the next Knesset, but... Uh, more uh, and more. More and more. And so, so as, as much as like we, we would like people like in the Knesset uh, drive only in a uh, hybrid or electrical mm. cars, uh, we, we expect of the people that we are electi electing in a, in a time like that to do all the, all the thing. And, and what, what uh, I really would like to, to tell that before I entered the Knesset, when I was still uh, a media person and I established the, the Meatless Monday campaign in Israel, we, we celebrated the Meatless Monday day in the Knesset, in the, in the cafeteria. Right. Uh, yes, and it was a very... Uh, um, very and, and it's still there and now they don't need to make a special day in the Knesset because there's a, a huge choice of vegan dishes every day really uh, yes as uh, i can tell you by per, from personal experience i don't have any problem as a vegan wow. to eat and eat good in the cafeteria of the Knesset there's always a really wide, wide variety of, uh, of vegan choices and, this and is this amazing. That was changed in the last uh, few mm -hmm. years. Yes. And it started with the Meatless Monday. So this is why I said that sometimes you don't need to, you know, to try and to turn everyone to be vegan. But, it's, but even if they lower the, com the consumption and they get sure. to know that plant-based food is tasty, is healthy, it's easy. It's, it's, it's like, you know, you put the, the foot in the door and then it's uh, the idea is spreading. True. Mm -hmm. well, what is your ideal picture, let's say for five years from now? How do you think the collaboration can be maximized uh, and lead to wider mm -hmm. angle planning and activities with the, let's say, let's go back to the other uh, panel discussion with the uh, maybe organizations like uh, Vegan Friendly and the hubs and the, you know, uh, uh, business uh, mm. uh, community. Yes. First, you know, especially in, in Israel, uh, we see that the number of people choosing to become vegan, vegetarian, or just to reduce the amount of meat they're eating is growing from year to year. And it is so much easier to be now vegan or vegetarian in Israel because the, 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 the choices that you can, you have in the supermarket are so big. And this is what, also the part of what is changing in the world. 
And so it's it's part of very good organization such as Vegan Friendly, which is doing you know a, a remarkable job here in Israel. And some of because uh, uh, people are more aware uh, for the environmental implications mm -hmm. that the livestock industry and the suffering is caused by it. So as much as we, there's more awareness, so people are changing their ways. And I and I see it especially in the in the young generation, which is very important. As 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 we 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 uh, we know Greta Thunberg and the the yeah. mass uh, mass uh, uh, teen uh, uh, that is following her uh, that are considered about the the climate crisis and this is part of it. Greta is also vegan, and uh, people if if you care about the planet, you know that you have to uh, eat, maybe not eat at all, which is of course I would love, <laughs> but at least eat less. So this is something that the young generation is understanding more and more, and it's very important because I, I see the, the young generation as really the, they are, they, they, they will make the chance, the, the cha change. And uh, you know, there's also, there have been in the last years, uh, very popular documentaries uh, that were uh, shown in Netflix, like the, the Game Changer, that show yeah. that people can be very, you know, athletes and the, uh, uh, top uh, top athletes and the sports uh, people and be vegan and um, this is something that really brings a, a change in the way people are thinking about because usually people were thinking about vegetarian or vegans people as very weak and yes. pay, and pale and they don't have the power and and here they see that top athletes are can be vegan and even that it sometimes helps them. So true. Um, we even saw before uh, we had a bodybuilder. Uh, she's <laughs> Miss uh, Israel, uh, plant-based bodybuilder Mayan. Yeah, Mayan. Uh, Mayan exactly. Eliassi. Exactly. And yes, and <laughs> they have the Tel Aviv uh, uh, vegan uh, protein uh, bakery. Mm -hmm. And this is quite amazing. You can actually be a bodybuilder. Exactly. Tel Aviv. <laughs> Tel Aviv absolutely is, is a heaven for vegan. There's a lot of places to eat and very good food. And um, what, what I was, uh, I wanted to say that even um, uh, there's a very popular TV program, it's called the Ninja Challenge. And all the three, the top three that, that won the, the, this uh, uh, in the late, uh, um, this year were vegan. Uh -huh. So this is okay. also something that, and then, and then they, they speak about it, and, they, and this is something. It's a good example for the for the young people to see that you can be healthy, you can be strong, you can be even to be the the ninja challenge the champion, and to be and to be vegan. So it is very important. Saying all that, uh, I don't I don't think that all the world will become vegan. I know I can understand that, but we need to uh, to work to slow down. Uh, the pace of consumption, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking only about meat. It's not about only what we eat. It's the amount of clothes that we are buying. It's the amount of water and resources that we use, and everything more. We have to consume a little bit less. And less. this is something I think that the, the time of this the pandemic also showed us that we can we can uh, deal with less and not with more and more and more. Uh, which I is totally agree thing. with you. And yes. uh, I live in Japan and I'm vegan in Japan. And, you know, with all the, the, the well-known fact that uh, Japan is not that vegan friendly, mm -hmm. but the consumption, at least the uh, food consumption is so Very small moderate. portions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they right. don't like eat a lot and they try not to uh, waste. A lot mm -hmm. like uh, there is an expression called mutainai, mm -hmm. uh, which is like uh, to waste on everything, not only food. Yes, the so wastage considered really rude and problematic. So, I know yeah. I, I had one of my, my, I think the best vegan meals I had was in Japan. It was, a, it's, it's a, um, I don't remember exactly the, the name, it's a Buddhist Zen kitchen. Sure. Shojin Ryori. Exactly. exactly. In Kyoto. A, it, I, I ate it in, in Tokyo. In Tokyo. A, okay. I think maybe like a six uh, dishes meal. 
everything was so beautiful and tasty and was like it's the change of the of the um, of the time of the year so it was before spring so everything was green it was yeah. beautiful delicious and inspiring that vegan food can be not only tasty but beautiful and very healthy I think and very, very satisfying very, as well yes yes <laughs> in all point of view so and, and I think that the, the big the growing market that we see and you, you, you talked about uh, someone from the kitchen hub uh, Israel has a lot of companies that are trying to produce uh, what is called clean meat which is yeah uh, cultured meat and exactly in the yeah. laboratories which I think will change the world and also um, like meat which is also became very popular very good very tasty and a lot of people don't have any problems to eat this kind of burgers or this kind of like chicken and so it's it's uh, as long as we will uh, give people the opportunity to um, to eat uh, um, good food that is tasty and healthy and not kill animals and and do all the other th- terrible things that this industry is doing to the environment it's a win-win it's a win-win it's good for the planet it's good for the body and it's good for the animals and this is why it is so important to spread this idea great thank you 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 actually you brought the So much hope <laughs> to this discussion uh, and you trust the the next generation that would be more uh, environmental friendly mm-hmm. uh, and really thank you for joining us our time is up uh, I think you're definitely making a better world mm-hmm. and thank hope you. to see you in Japan and thank you very much. Know, on our next Arigato day event. Gozaimasu. Arigato. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both, Sharon and Chavrat Knesset uh, Miki Chaimovic. I must say, as a, as a woman, as a political activist, social activist, you are a role model, and thank you so much to manage to come on a webinar. It meant a lot for us. I uh, would like to invite you to our uh, continuous uh, event we are planning for an expo in Japan in uh, November. And if you can be a keynoter in Japan, it will be our uh, privilege and we'll be happy to invite you for these events too. I will, I will be happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now I would like to thank you all for your inputs and insights. I learned a lot from this session. I hope you too. I want to thank all speakers for participating. I know your time is precious and your support along the way, it uh, more than words can uh, say. Thank you all for attending today's webinar and I invite you to join tomorrow and learn more about Israel, Japan, Agritech, especially urban farming sector, as we said, plant-based food and urban farming. It's the most sustainable way for our societies to get along in the future. And uh, we need to leave something for the next generations. And this is how we start with collaboration. So we are invite you to join us tomorrow too. And thank you so much for uh, joining our webinar. We know it's a bit longer than usual, but as you see, all of our speakers are very enthusiastic and um, we wanted to hear them all. Thank you very much. We will leave the uh, floor uh, open for questions if you have. And we will answer them on our um, forum in our uh, website. We will send all attendees, all people that register an email with all the links to where you can find contact person, where you can find the answers for your questions on the forum. And of course, for our future events. Thank you very much for participating today. All speakers, all attendees. not take it as counted at all. Thank you very much and have a nice day for those that are in Israel and a good night for those that are in Japan. <laughs>